Forgetting Asheville is an actual play Chronicles of Darkness podcast set in the fictional New England town of Asheville. We're all friends, we're here to have fun, but our story can include graphic violence, drug use, sexual content, and other mature themes. Content warnings can be found in the show notes. We've talked at our table about safety, comfort, and consent, both as players and storytellers. We know what to expect, we're all excited to be here, and we want you to feel the same. So listener discretion is advised. Now let's forget our troubles. Last time on Forgetting Asheville. John and Dan investigated the Starkweather tool factory in a machine called the Cradle. John and Estrada met and discovered a pit of blood and bodies. Amber was taken over by the God Machine and attacked Dan. Lola summoned Aviva and Jesse into Ramona Castro's dreamscape, where they all fought. Aviva and Lola fled into the Mind Mage's hidden memories while Jesse fought within the collapsing dream. Aviva, Lola, and Jesse escape with a boxed memory and Ramona's arcane set of keys. Dan, John, the two of you hurry across the parking lot with Estrada. Dan, you're carrying the unconscious form of Amber, heading towards, I presume, John's car? Uh, yeah. Estrada is just kind of following with you guys. He is very clearly in that mode of like, he's very freaked out by what he just saw. Estrada's just a guy, but he had it together enough to like take a bunch of pictures and has, like, direct photo evidence of some shit. Yeah, I mean, I was just hit with the infrastructure vision, I believe. Mm -hmm. Like the others before you, not that you're aware of this necessarily, but like the others before you, you also managed to sort of shrug off at least the immediate effects of witnessing the tower. Right, and I'm also aware of a... The thing has a weakness. You are aware, that's right, based on your exceptional role when you're looking that all infrastructure you are aware on an instinctual warriors level that all infrastructure like this has some weakness whether it be metaphysical whether it be like truly a loose bolt it, it's unclear but you, one single bolt but you know that there is a weak point somewhere something that can collapse the infrastructure you just have to figure out what so yeah i'm running i'm keeping pace with these guys really i think more or less than full out you could even yeah. holding her you could probably outpace these guys but by the time they get to the car, John's like loosened his tie, and he's going to open up the back seat to help, quote unquote, Dan uh, get Amber into the car. Estrada immediately goes for the driver's door, like, "Hey, give me the keys." Give Dan the keys, <laughs> and then I head around to the passenger seat and I get in. Yep, I get into the driver's seat. He just sighs and gets <laughs> into the back next to Amber. Um, Look, if something happens to her, you're probably the only one that can give her first aid, right? Yeah, I, um, so yeah. we should keep her hands free, right? All right. What what the hell happened with her? I don't know. Um, a gear came out of her head. What? A gear came out of her head. She tried to attack me. I assume like the car's starting. Yeah, 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 yeah. I started the car up. Started like I don't necessarily floor it in this area, but I can get us out of there without making too much of a ruckus. You pass through the gate to get out of, like, the factory area, right? Because remember, it's all fenced in. You guys went through the gate. You make it out of the gate onto the street. Everybody in the car, roll me a wit's composure for a perception check. You know, it's it's super impressive that he was able to get photo evidence of all this. Because I know geists are particularly hard to take pictures of. Like, a normal flash on a camera won't do it. You need, like, extra lighting. Because the spirit is willing, but the flash is weak. No. <laughs> Rebecca, cut all of that. <laughs> what if I leave it in? Rebecca, cut that part too. I completely fail. Three successes. Dan, you're driving off and you notice, you know, it's late, whatever. There's not a lot of nightlife in Asheville, but it's not uncommon to see cars out. It's only like, what, 10, 11 o'clock maybe? Something like midnight, that. so well, it's it's not evening time, it's not yeah. crazy late, and you see a car following you. It's like back enough where it's like reasonably subtle. Estrada doesn't seem to notice. He's he's actually zip tying Amber's wrists together, not taking any chances. John doesn't seem to notice, but you notice that you are being you are being followed. What kind of car? It's like an old sedan. Like it's an old like big sedan. Um, I guess the question is, do I recognize it? You know what? You would, actually. You know most of the cars in town. Right. Yeah, it's this, like, an old tan 
Oldsmobile that you know is still kept in repair and driven by this guy named Eric Walker. You know, because he usually comes to you for, like, little help with stuff. He just loves that fucking old car. Like, it's just a fucking piece. It's a piece of shit from, like, the 80s, but he loves it. You also know that he works at the factory. Roll me just, like, a raw intelligence here. Oh, no. <laughs> mean. If he's thinking hard, can he add his strength? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a single success. Thank you. <laughs> and you also actually remember just hearing at, you know, a bunch of guys that, like, you know, come into June's Diner or whatever. And you remember kind of overhearing that, like, Eric recently had been taking a bunch of sick days. Hasn't really been seen at work for a few days now. A few days, maybe a week. You know, it, again, time is a little weird right now, but, like, Eric has been calling out sick. But here he is, driving a car, tailing you and John. And I didn't remember seeing him at the meeting? He was not at the meeting at okay. all, no. Hey, hey, John. Yeah? We're being followed by... It looks like Eric Walker. I don't see anything. I kind of like look don't, over my don't shoulder. Don't look too hard. Like, oh, okay. I sit, sit use, straight. Use your mirrors. I see headlights. Okay. Well, that's that's his car. Trust me. What do you need? I don't know. He's been he's been calling us sick a lot. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if he was a churchgoer before. He was. Yeah, he might be a. Uh, he might have some rat problems. I look over my shoulder. Hey, can you get a good look at him in there? What, can what, you see him? Can can you see his face? Not in the headlights at night. That's not. Just how look. Oh, Jesus. All right, cool. As he looks, I put my hand on the dashboard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I am going to cast magic on the car. So, and so you I you perform some sleight of hand and distraction to perform magic. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I will attempt to transform. Uh, at least the internals of this car into a dream machine for uh, Dan. <laughs> okay. You spend anything on this? Unfortunately, three mana. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah. You sure you don't want me to kill him? This is in direct opposition to the cult, so you may use the spinning wheel. Three successes. Tim? Yes. Because it's like a, a higher end car, it's got a handling bonus of plus one to your drive rolls. I'm going to crank that. Sorry, it's just one additional, so that's going to be a total of plus two dice. Got it. The car starts to purr and starts to feel a lot better on the road. And it was already in a pretty great place. Estrada looks back over her shoulder at the two of you, conveniently not having witnessed the sleeper, not having witnessed the magic. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't see shit through the headlights. But you're sure that's... Uh, I know the car. Okay. You know how to lose a tail? I do. He like looks at you like that, like, wait a minute. And I, I explore it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're going to make a contested driving roll between you and Eric Walker. Nice. You get the dice bon uh, bonus from the tuned up car. And he also gets that cult bonus. Yes, he does. Because as far as you're aware, Eric is directly tied to the cult. Eric will get a one die car bonus because Dan helps him keep this car in shape. Sounds like you got more than one success. John checks his seatbelt. Six. <laughs> it's an exceptional success. You managed to lose Eric pretty easily, which is funny because like this is a small town with not a ton of streets. And in fact, as you're driving, John, you'll recognize this because you've run into it before. The streets are working against you, but with an exceptional success, you still manage to apparently lose Eric. The four of you in the car have a moment to breathe. But you know that at least one individual, whether they're related to the Order of the Toolmaker or the Beshalu or something else, is out here looking for you. I think I'm going to head towards the police station. That seems the most out of the way and at least somewhat secured. It's your best bet right now. They're coming for us one way or another. Somebody is. You want to give me something here where if Amber wakes up in custody, I, I know why she's in there? Drunk and disorderly? Yeah, just drop us off at the station. The two of you, I don't know, we'll figure something out. John, your phone rings. Who's calling? Unknown number. It's a local number, but unknown. I answer the phone. John speaking. Hi, uh, is, is Dan there? It's a woman's voice. I sigh. Hey, Dan, you got a, a caller. Uh, sorry, is... Do you want to leave a message with him? 
I, I would really like to talk to him, if I could. Uh, Dan Pullover, are you okay? I, I don't know. I don't know. I just know that I was told if weird stuff happened, I should call Dan. All right. Dan, we're swapping drivers. You got a call. I pull over in dramatic fashion. <laughs> I have not decided what that is, but I feel like it is like a half circle. Buddy, make me a drive check. <laughs> Excellent. Two successes. Yeah, how cool do you want this to be? <laughs> just like an Akira stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it? Always that That's all. it. That's it. Just an Akira iconic stop. stop. Well, if I had three successes, I would also get out of the car as a... <laughs> <laughs> But you're being reasonable. I'm being reasonable right now, yeah. That famous motorcycle stop in the car. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's all he wants to do. That's it. <laughs> I mean, not the same that's slide, it. but more like yeah. the tail comes around and then there's like a mile, sl- yeah. like a little bit more okay. normal-ish. Into Just like a, a parallel little. park. That's it. That's all he wants. <laughs> Just a little bit. I didn't say an Ace Ventura parking job. <laughs> Estrada, who's not expecting you to do like a fucking spin out stop here, is like mashed against the fucking <laughs> door in the back seat. What the fuck, Dan? Aren't you supposed to be wearing a seatbelt? Isn't that the law? Oh, my God. He's right, actually. <laughs> I got out of the car. I'll grab the phone as we switch positions. Yep. Dan here. Hi. Uh... God damn it, too. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, Dan. This yeah. um, Jen told me if, if there was anything weird in the house that I, I should call you. Um, I don't really know how to, I don't really know how to explain this. I just... Are, are you busy? No. What what's going on and where are you at? Uh I'm I'm at I'm at her place, our place, and uh I just um I don't know, she's not home. She's out of town, but I just I don't know. It's I don't feel safe here and I, I don't know. All right. Lock the door. We'll be there soon. Okay. Look, I know we haven't met before, but like don't judge the state of the house, okay? It's a little you know, I got like rat traps and stuff out, so never do. Okay. Thanks. Yep. This is, uh, well, we'll do introductions in a minute. Yeah. She hangs up. We gotta get over to Jen's place. I'll tell you how to get there. Okay. Sure. Are you still dropping us off at the station? Yeah, we probably shouldn't bring Amber. Is it someone along the way? It's not a big town, Dan. I mean, we could, yeah. Yes. We'll make it fast. Yeah, from here to Jen's Light's place? It's just a couple of blocks out of the way. Sounds good. It's all you, John. All right, let's go. Make the stop. We're gonna be in touch. We just need to take care of something really quick. Just, yeah. I think we all got a lot to talk about, so don't leave me hanging on this one, okay? Like, like 15 minutes, right? Hopefully within the hour. No promises, as soon as possible. Yeah. Well, if anything fucking weird happens here, I'll call you too. Uh, please. Okay. Do you guys want walkies instead of these fucking cell phones? Yes. All right, yeah, me, all the equipment you got, bring it on. Get, okay, well, no, not... A, give me a minute. While he's doing that, I'm going to change out of my suit into the armor in the trunk. Yeah. Okay. Estrada runs inside, comes back out uh, with a, like a little cardboard box that's got like four walkies in it and another one that he's like clipping onto his belt. Frequency five, you know, go to channel five. Okay. Got it. Channel one is police. No chance the mayor's not listening to that shit. But yeah, channel five, we should be okay. Okay. But anybody can pick up these fucking signals if they've got a fucking reader. And I know at least your uncle does. And he looks at John. So, like... Then let's be subtle. Yeah. And he gives you guys the box of four walkies and picks Amber up. Not quite strong enough to do it like Dan where he can just, like, casually carry her around. So he, like, kind of fireman carries her. And they go into the station. Stay in touch. Door closes. The rats have too much information. Something's going on. You think... All right. John makes the point of getting to the car much faster than it was before, and he was already kind of hustling about to help. And we are going to head straight there. Okay. You get there without too much problem. Right? You know you know the way to Jen's place. It's a duplex, mm-hmm. right? So it's like, a, it's like a multifamily home. The first floor, you're not really sure who lives there, uh, but Jen lives on the second floor. You've been there plenty of times before. Might have been a little bit, but... You've been there, and you can see a light is on upstairs. It's one of the ones where there's, like, like a staircase on the side that's covered and boxed in. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, And that goes up to the door to her place. I get out of the car fairly quickly, even though uh, she's supposedly not here. And I basically take the stairs two at a time. You get up to the door, no problem. Do a couple knocks. John's going to come along behind him, and I intend to burn one more mana. 
and generate kinetic armor. It doesn't look like anything. It's just that attacks made against me slow down. Okay. I kind of give Dan a nod. Dan, you can tell something smells. Rotten food, black mold, something. Jen has always kept this place pretty clean. You know, it's, it's been a while since you've been here, but like it smells like, yeah, like a mold problem in the walls, rotting garbage. And after the knocks, a small woman comes to the door. She's like five foot nothing, dark skin, like shoulder length dreads. She looks like maybe f- vaguely familiar from around town. You don't really know her. And she looks up at you wearing like shorts and an athletic tee like she was just working out. And it's like, well, shit, you must be Dan. Not another. Jen's told me a lot about you. Uh, come on inside. As I'm looking inside, how's... So the house looks like it's supposed to have been kept clean. There's not like a ton of dishes in the sink. A couple. Right. But nothing crazy. Uh, garbage is not overflowing. But what you do see is a black mold starting to creep up the walls. Just a lot of like parts of the ceiling look water damaged. Parts of the like the drywall look like they're rotting away. Like years of decay in a place that is lived in. And she goes... Sorry about the smell. I, it's part of the reason I wanted to... I don't know. How recent is this? A couple of, couple of days. At first I thought it was just a little water spot, but it gets... It's getting bigger. Down below or from up above? Just out of the wall. It's b- both. I thought it was... But the, the roof is intact. And I keep seeing these things and having nightmares. And I'm afraid to go in. Afraid to go to sleep. Go in the closet. I just, I'm, I'm glad Jen's not here right now. I'm glad she's out of town. Why don't you grab a couple of things? You, you can't stay here. I mean, this you, is her place. Like you, I'm just staying here. I don't. Yeah. Do you, do you trust Jen? Do I trust Jen? I love Jen. Okay. Of course I do. Well, I know Jen very well too. And you, I, your, I know. For your safety, you can't, you can't stay here. There's something going on here, and I don't have the time or the ability to fully explain it to you. Okay. So you're going to have to trust me. I, I do. Jen said if something weird ever happened that I should call and talk to you. Yeah. Um, we need to get you out of here. I'm uh, Kendra, by the way. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Kendra. Um, John. John, John says speaking, speaking. <laughs> She like uh, finally recognized. It, John, you have been like observing these interactions. Kendra is very clearly freaked out and sort of comforted that like the person that her girlfriend said was yeah going to help is yeah. here. Also, she's clearly sizing this dude up. Yeah, I, I picked like, that up. Okay. But as the uh, person who is the known murderer of the town, yeah, I uh, Jen doesn't really like speak up right away. Mm-hmm. Instead, he kind of focuses on looking around for signs for about sure. what happened here. She goes, "Okay, I'll I'll be right back. I just I get something out of the bedroom. Oh, I got a gym bag, and I'll just throw some stuff in there. Sounds perfect." Keep the doors open. Okay. You know, if you see anything. And she goes into the background, into the bedroom, uh, leaving the two of you alone in the main room. John. Yeah. Does your, whatever you do. Uh, what do you need me to do? I need to know where this rot is coming from in here. I'm guessing it's the basement of the first floor. Based on what you guys have mentioned so far of these Bechelou guys, it's probably coming from somewhere in the basement. I can go take a look. Uh, not yet. Um... I'm going to take a look here to see if you can take, if you can tell anything from up here. I'm going to look across. Okay. Yeah. I, I can help. I'm, I'm definitely going to go ahead and give you some assistance. He like takes his tie off all the way. Uh, we're kind of really well dressed for this. Um, uh, that's why I already switched out. <laughs> <laughs> Let us try to know that we're probably going to have someone else that he's going to need to keep an eye on. And I'm going to go ahead and see what I can find out here. And I'm going to take a second to look across the seal. So you look across the gauntlet into the shadow. Mm -hmm. What you will recognize is that the gauntlet is thin here too. Not in the same way that like the church basement or presumably the place that Jesse saw is. But so like the whole swarm is not here chewing, but something has been here also weakening the Hisil. But what you see, and you see like a few little rats and stuff when you look across, right? Like not the whole swarm, but a few of them are here. Which is weird, because they're not with the whole swarm. They maybe should be. And you look out the window, right? Just, you're nearby. Scanning it's a, the area. It's a small place, scanning yeah. the area. And outside, in the Hisil, 
you see the massive form of a rotting stag. However, it is looking directly up at you with an insane intelligence. It is different than the last time you saw Carrion Feast. Its rib cage is made of like bent, broken, rotting arms ending in like grasping, horrible hands. The antlers on its head, the massive stag's antlers, are now arms that like stretch out of the sides of its head where antlers should be, grasping and rotting like flesh falling off of it perpetually. The maggots and flies that used to writhe and weren't like the worms that used to be part of its very nature of rot, you see are now little like broken. They're still squirming around, but the closer you look, the more you see that these are fingers that the very organs of this thing are like grasping, writhing hands and fingers and arms that all start to constitute around this grotesque, rotting stag's corpse. And it looks up at you, and though it has a bony stag's face completely bereft of anything but scraps of flesh, you can feel it looking at you with hateful calculation through the window. And around it, you see fearful little rats chewing on the gauntlet, targeting this place for its connection to you. As the two Uratha, the only threats to a major spirit or a Magath in the area are currently separated. The rot that you see even on this side of the, the Hisil being a consequence of the thinning gauntlet and this thing, Rot's caresses, very presence. We don't have a lot of time then, right? Is that what I'm getting the sense of? That depends. I mean, spirits have their own sense of time, and also Magath are fundamentally insane. But you know that there is a dearth of essence. You know that there are multiple points where the Beshalu have been driven to weaken the gauntlet. Which is something they do on their own. But if there are Magath around, if there are things around that would want to step through into reality to feast and escape the drought within the Hisil, and it's already this bad, and that it is targeting at least a few areas where you are and you frequent or that means something to you, probably not. You also know a Magath of this level. It is confident to take on one Uratha, even even Arahu. It's probably why it is escalating now of all nights. It's the new moon. And Magath may be insane, but some of them can be very clever. You're being hunted. Is there normally rats on this side that would also need to weaken the gauntlet? Or are they all on that side? There are a few rats on this side. John checks the rat traps first. There's a couple. One has two tails. One has like sort of an oversized mouth. They look like little deformed rats. There's a couple on this side and some on the other. Like I said, Jesse has found the nest. Most of them are elsewhere in that place near the factory, supposedly. But that does not mean that there are not a few around. And if they are being driven by a clever Magath to flush out its prey, they might have some on both sides. I'm going to take like a kitchen knife put it through one of the rats that i find particularly the one with two tails mm -hmm. and i'm gonna head over to dan and just hold out the rat with the two tails hey i think i know what's rotting the walls we told the magath came up in conversation before the what um it's a spirit that ate another spirit that it wasn't supposed to it's very bad how bad Seven out of ten. You know I can't do anything to a spirit, right? Uh, I can't currently do anything to this spirit right now either. And, and I can't defend against them. Uh, yeah, it's using the rats to get to the gauntlet. We need to take care of this thing soon, and I think it is targeting me and or us. So us being Jesse. So this is a trap? Wait, okay, so yeah. when do you want to deal with that? Uh, we need to go get Jesse. 
Jesse's indisposed. Um, maybe, maybe we can, you know, channel him. What? I mean, okay. Indisposed is just a giant rage monster. First things first. We need to find your friend, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, she's not in town, supposedly. What? Kendra comes back out from the bat uh, from the bag. She's got a huge, like, spalding gym bag over her shoulders. Okay, I got stuff. We're ready to go. There is absolutely no way to tell how somebody is infected with a rat. Is there? There is. How? I look at her soul. <laughs> Multi-genre movie. <laughs> <laughs> Make the roll. She may notice that I am like. When she walks in, I kind of give her a weird look and start kind of clicking my rings against each other and start drawing on those runes. She looks at Dan. You sure about this guy? Oh, most definitely. He, he kind of coming. He's giving all like psychopath vibes here. He's checking the vibes. He's checking the vibes. Yeah. Two successes. Two successes on vibe check. <laughs> on a vibe check. The vibes of her soul are unratted. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. You're good, though. We should go. I'm... You're sure, sure. 100%. I would not share a phone with any other person. Okay. Is that why he picked up the phone? Yeah, Yeah, it was my phone. Let's go. Do you not have your own phone? I do not. It's a long story involving my brother. Happy to help, though, even though I'm a weirdo. Let's go. Great. Sounds good. Uh, And... So where are we going? PlayStation. Speaking of people who give me bad vibes, I don't like that cop. Oh, he's on our side currently. Yeah, I get it. Fine, but he can protect me from whatever this is? What is this? What is going on? This is not just water damage. Bad vibes. you got to stop saying vibes. Uh, I don't have a better explanation for you without getting too far into things that I can't necessarily explain. Well, Dan doesn't explain... I'm going to go put the rat that's unpaled on a kitchen knife away before she kind of takes notice. Yeah, you did the whole thing holding a rat on a knife. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, I'm not fucking weird. <laughs> Look, Staring into her soul, <laughs> clicking rings, holding an impaled two, two-tailed rat. I'm not weird, you're weird. <laughs> Vibe check. <laughs> uh, yeah, she's going to roll for vibe check. <laughs> Your vibes are okay with me. <laughs> All right, Dan, let's go. Essentially, um, there is something in the area that is... Um, hey, hold on. I appreciate that you're willing to tell me stuff. Is this, is this the stuff that you won't talk to Jen about? Yes. Okay, then I don't want to know it. Okay. I wasn't going to tell you too much anyways. Well, that's what fucked you guys up. I don't want that to do that with me. Well, I'm glad we're all on the same page. Great. Are we going? Yeah, let's get out. Oh, sure. I I will trust you. Jen trusts you. I trust you. Sounds good. I'm going to go start the car. Go. Car starts. and I'm going to go start the car. Yep. For the two people who can't see into the gauntlet, uh, across the gauntlet, you know, you're out there. It's dark. Bad vibes in the area. Dan... You're the only one who can see Rot's caress just slowly walking towards the car, looking right at you with, like, a manic glee. Um, it turns out that after I look back in the normal realm, I can't see him either. I can't, I can't operate like that. My senses can only be in one place at a time. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, yeah. So you cannot see I cannot. S- as soon as I stop looking at him and go back to the looking in and around the apartment, I can't see him anymore. Okay. So you just have a bad feeling. I just have you bad just feelings. Have a, yeah. So, yeah. You it's have mostly a, just like, hurry, let's go. You have a very bad feeling. Yeah. The best I can do is I can, in theory, I can make myself deaf and extend my hearing towards the other side, which is about as best I can get you without, could, like... You could also say, extend your scent into the true which maybe I not I, the best idea nah, considering oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably no, smells pretty fresh <laughs> no thank you <laughs> my touch <laughs> so you don't notice anything as all of you and actually all of you start to get this overwhelming sense of dread as you approach the car have any of you in real life ever had this experience where it's like late at night and you walk towards a car and you just get this overwhelming idea that something is going to reach out and grab you from the darkness underneath the car? 
Is that just a me fear? I mean, if you take away underneath a car that's just walking at night as a girl. Fair enough. Coming upstairs in the be- the basement, same idea. Yeah, that something's gonna reach through the crack and just like drag you into the darkness. As you go to like physically step into the car, Kendra stops and is like, "I don't. What's going on? Something's wrong with your car." Just like paralyzed by that, just the the hint of that fear of being dragged into the darkness. And John pulls his gun, and I'm gonna check underneath the car. There's nothing down there. I'll check the other side. The other side of the car or the other side of the gauntlet? The seal. Okay. <laughs> now you see, extremely up close, like right by the car, Rot's caress. You can make out every detail of this hideous monstrosity. And on the ground around it is like a squirming mat of like maggots and worms just rotting and devouring everything they touch. But this close, you can once again recognize every single one of those hideous insects is just a finger moving on its own, this aura of whatever. So there's nothing in the twilight or on this side currently, but just being this close to this thing is giving that overwhelming sense of fear. So it's my like, understanding is that it it is utilizing its presence, but it can't actually do anything it is not currently your understanding is that it cannot unless it can cross and like materialize into the twilight or the material world like the grubbler somehow did still hanging thread mystery uh a while ago yeah that Um, wouldn't occur to me unless it can do that in theory no it can't actually do anything from that side of the gauntlet that's the whole point of the gauntlet that father wolf put up right this is just i don't know feedback aura almost yeah there's like, some sort of, yeah. Like... Because the car's not on the other side. It's not. Right. They... Spirits feed off the essence of things created in the real world. This is some sort of, like, feedback on the other side where, like, just the vibes on this side across the gauntlet, to the, use you guys' words from this, before... This episode's name is Vibes, by the way. <laughs> ...are just so off that feeling the... The presence on the other side of the gauntlet of this Magath is enough to just put everybody's hair up on end. You can't imagine without the strength of the gauntlet. Even though the gauntlet's a little weaker here, you cannot imagine how things would feel without the strength of the gauntlet. Uh, like, it would be a truly, even for Rahu, perhaps, paralyzing presence. I pull back my senses. John, give me the keys. As your senses pull back, yeah. you can see it starting to mouth things off the side of its face. Like... Like, its uh, deer skull mouth, like, fills with those fingers. So it's, like, choking and spitting out worms that drool and drop to the ground. But within that mass of writhing worms, you see, like, a little mouth start to form, moving and saying things. But you pull your senses back. I was about to say, nope, don't need to know what it says. (laughs) That's totally fair. (laughs) Not curious. <laughs> no, fuck that. I thought we already established that's a trait of mine. <laughs> Don't need to know. It's good. And you get in the car. Uh, you can manage to persuade Kendra to get into the car, too. She- yeah, I figure from the other side, at least, if I get the car going and yeah. like yeah, the lights are on in the guy. inside. And- she doesn't need a whole lot of convincing. She needs about as much as convincing as Dan does. Right. You steal your resolve and get in. And okay. like almost at the same time, she Got steals it. her resolve and gets okay. in the car. And we'll high-speed drive off away from this horrible thing. As you drive off. Yeah. John, how long do the tune-up bonuses work? Is it just there? Mm, Yeah. Okay. Now it's not. That extra purr and hum seems to give way as... The car is still fine. It is not currently breaking down. Or rather, it is. It was just overtuned as you start to drive off. It's starting to affect the real world. The gauntlet's getting thin. All right. Is this... Can you take this guy? Not on my own. John makes a face at that. Well, <laughs> if he wasn't... If he didn't have other people with him, I'd have a pretty good shot. <laughs> All right, Dan. <laughs> Sorry, man. I believe you. Okay. Kendra? Yeah. We're going to take it to the police, but we're also going to keep in touch, if that's okay with you. 
Yeah, I don't know what's going on, but something. I. This town's fucking weird. You guys know that, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. I've only lived here like a few months, and this place is fucked up. All right, so well, cops a douchebag, but he will look out for you at least till dawn, and in the morning we'll get you set up with a place to stay that's a little, you know, less terrible. And in the meantime, you see any rats or uh, anything? Get that bad feeling you just had a little while ago? Okay. You call that same number you call to contact Ann immediately, and we're going to come help you out. Welcome to Nashville. Where'd Jen go? She's out of town. She went to a library conference. Like when? I don't know, like two days ago. She's going to be gone for the weekend. She said she was going to be back in time for the Founders Day Festival. Okay. Well, generally lines up. That's good. Yeah. That's why I felt weird. You know, I've only been here a little bit, and then her apartment starts to fall to shit, but... She's got you as an emergency contact, so. I'm pretty sure it's not your fault that the department went to shit. Mm-hmm. So, we're your emergency contact, too, now. So, if something else comes up, you know, again, please let us know. She kind of cold shoulders John a little bit and is like, yeah, okay, I will. Like, clearly talking directly at Dan. <laughs> <sighs> Fuck. Hey, uh. Yeah? This place doesn't have, like, a gym or anything, does it? Of course it does. Asheville? Yeah. Okay. Is it okay? Is it decent? Because I haven't had a decent workout since I got here. It's pretty good. Okay. Sorry, I, I know this is like way off topic, but like when I when I get stressed, I just want to like I just want to work out. Yeah, this is a pretty good one. I maintain most of the machines myself. Shit. All right. We, uh, you're like a big guy. You must bench a lot. That is correct. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> Jared is dying over there. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Guess we'll be seeing each other a lot. Yeah, guess so. You don't still have feelings for her, do you? It's just Weird fucking question. out and says it. <laughs> and you're starting to, John, you are starting to get the impression that maybe a lot like Dan, mm-hmm. this woman is pretty straightforward, <laughs> is social but doesn't always like play the social games, just gets straightforward to shit. Is tiny where Dan is huge, but otherwise pretty good shape. I just look between the two of them. Shake my head. <laughs> Maybe the cops got a lap bar or something. I can. I'm sure. Okay. And she just kind of goes quiet and is like looking out the window, like in in her thoughts or lack thereof, as you guys drive to the police station. You want to call Estrada and let her know, let him know that we are coming. Yeah, sure. There's someone else we need you to keep an eye on for a bit, but no immediate emergencies. There's no answer. <clears throat> okay. Once we pull up, yeah, I'm, I'm going in. And I get out, and I start looking for Estrada. The lights are off in the police station. Except for the emergency lights. Like somebody cut power to the police station. Are there any obvious signs of where that happened? Not on the inside. Okay. I'm going to follow him, tell Kendra to hang out in the car for now. Lock the doors, keep low. Yeah, okay. She, like, shrinks down. And again, she's, like, five foot nothing. She, yeah. It's very easy for her to just, like, not be in sight line. I follow him on you. It's pretty suspicious. Click flashlight on. And uh, I'll start snooping around. Pretty quickly, you downstairs in one of the holding cells, you see Estrada. The walkie is, like, out outside of arm's reach beyond the bars. It's actually in the same holding cell that you and Aviva had been in earlier. The doors are closed and locked. He is zip-tied and beaten severely. Amber is nowhere to be seen. So this isn't great. I kind of looked at Dan. Did Amber do this? I would guess that would be what happened. I have for the cell and I'm going to open it. That's why we don't use zip-ties. I mean, pretty easy to break. It opens. Yeah, you can, you can, you know, there's an emergency release, obviously, so that people don't, like, get trapped in here when the power goes out. Hey, you gotta wake up. I go and check on him. Uh, Slap him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a code 311. Amber is the culprit of this atrocity. Yeah. Oh, oh, damn it. <laughs> it's an Amber alert. You can't make me edit that out. <laughs> Fuck. 
you like rouse him a little bit and he just kind of comes to consciousness like, oh God, what the fuck? shit, Jesus, that was a fucking escalation. All right, John, uh, Dan, hey, are you okay? Is everybody okay? I mean, you're not. Shit, do no shit. Did Amber do this? No. Who? I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, I fucking know, but I don't know. They were wearing hoods and shit. They? How many? I uh, Like six. Cultists. How did they get in? I was putting her in here, and and then I was going back up to do some paperwork. I got jumped on the stairs. It's like they knew where she was. There's this guy. I, he fucking had... It's like... He was huge. He fucking hit me with a goddamn sledgehammer. Or like a I don't know. And they just beat my ass. Threw me in here and took her. What's the state of his soul? There is the harsh mechanical whir of corruption that he does not know is there. And as you ask that question, are you guys helping him up or leaving him there? I help him up. As you're helping him up on like the lower part of his back, like just under his belt line, you see as he gets up, like his shirt comes out a little bit. There's a little bit of blood on the bottom of his shirt. And you can see a pin shoved directly into his skin under his belt where he was beaten so badly he doesn't even seem to know yet. John just kind of frowns. I pull the pin. Oh, fuck me. I can help, but I'll need time. I don't have a lot of choice in the matter, do I? No, you don't. I'm not going into that pit, am I? N- no, no. I don't mean from you. I mean, like, whatever the fuck is going on here. No, because we're going to do something about it. John, you would also perhaps have reason to believe no because he was pinned. Yeah, I know. He was He's not branded. But I am going to not remove his deep fear of ending up there because right now that's probably going to help him. Probably. Fear of dying is good. <laughs> Fuck me. All right. God damn it. All right, what did you guys need? Why are you back? Well... I, uh, originally, the plan was for you to keep an eye on Dan's new friend, Kendra. Um, Is that new girl to move to town? Yes. I don't keep track of people here. I do. But. Okay. Sure. Great. What's wrong with her? What's going on? She's being targeted because of us. It's a fucking cultist. A similar situation. Similar enough that I was hoping that you might be able to keep an eye on her just until we can make sure things are safe. I mean, how much can I be trusted right now? He said, like looks to John and like it's a legitimate question based in fear. So, I don't mean to get bossy, but you're going to crash in my place. You and Kendra, I need time, but I think with a bit of time I can help you. And Are you sure you want me around your uncle? Not my uncle's place. Mine. Oh. Okay. I need to be able to observe and work on your situation. Once you're on your feet and okay, we'll need you to still keep an eye on Kendra. We we have to come back to that plan. Because what's going on here is we are quickly developing loose ends that can end up getting really hurt in all of this. And while I think we can make headway with this problem, I'm going to need someone that we can trust. And right now, it's you. And we got to make sure that you remain someone that we can trust. Yeah, okay. So let's get back to Kendra. She's in the car, and I don't think anyone should be left alone. And let's get out of here. John, your phone rings. It's the same number that called you before. Hello? Hey, I'm getting that really bad feeling. Okay, we're going out. All right, John starts going out. Dan, get ready for a fight. I was already ready. She's got the feeling again. We need to hurry. There's not much we can do right now. You guys go back outside, and as soon as you leave the police station, you start to get it too. So does Estrada. But he's already so keyed up from everything that happened that like he... It's almost like he can't quite differentiate the fear of like what's happened to him from the fear in the area but none of you were quite attacked. It seems like it's still on the other side of the gauntlet, at least for now. Probably. 
John doesn't really feel that there's anything he can do to this thing if it if this turns into a fight. So most of his energy is going to be spent being as useful to Dan as possible. He's going to make sure everyone gets in the car. He's going to make sure like the car's starting. He's going to make sure he's keeping an eye out on potential problems while Dan kind of essentially sits ready to fight the fight if it happens. The four of you pile into the car. Unaccosted, unfought as of now, where do you go? Who are these people going after? Pretty sure they're going after me. Should I check on my Uncle Ernie? I think you might be okay. I think they're trying to drive us out. Specifically, I think they're trying to drive me out. John, not slowly. Okay, I trust you. I've got the walkie. You have the walkie. What time of night is it? Let's say it's around midnight-ish, maybe a little bit after at this point. Probably one now. Probably like, around midnight Yeah, pushing to one. Earlier. I think I need to go. The uh, hut. I can't fight it, but I can keep it somewhere else. No. And not keep it, but I can keep on the move. No. And then I would need you to get Jesse and them and go with the original plan. I can't. What do you mean you can't? If I go to grab Jesse, there's a chance he'll freak out. At least stick by us until I know I can get Jesse. I mean, I got until dawn. Yeah. I got four or five hours of running that I can do. We risk losing both of you. Unlikely. I don't understand. It's going to come wherever we are. Yeah. And I don't know if everything else can stand being near it. Being optimistic, you said you could take it 1v1, and it's not going to do that. Right. So the math says stay with the group. I get that. I plan on meeting back up with you guys. I can't win. I'm just going to keep it busy. You guys can recoup, grab the rest of the stuff, and then meet up with me. At that original place. But think about it, Dan. If I had easy access to you, it would have struck. I'm afraid if it's either going to go away and do some more damage somewhere else. If I can keep it busy for a couple hours. I'm not thinking this is going to be terribly long. At the least. That's what I'm thinking. I understand, but hear me out, okay? Sure. You and Jesse are probably the only actual solution to this thing. I am not in support of gambling that solution in hopes of preventing whatever damage that it can do in the meantime. Especially with no guarantee this isn't worth the risk, Dan. Tim, if you want, you may roll me a wit survival based on what you know of Carrion Feast. What you think Dan's chances are of outpacing this thing. That'll be no successes. Do you want to botch? <laughs> Yeah, sure, why not? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Dramatic failure clock. Then, yeah, so you think about your plan to deal with Rot's caress. Drawing it away from John, trying to get everybody together to come hunt it. And you consider where you can try and lead this to in such a way that, you know, that you could, like, trap it and fight it when everyone is together, right? Either on this side of the gauntlet or the other side of the gauntlet. And so tell me... Communicate to John right here where you want to meet up, assuming he can help you, and we'll go from there. And you will communicate out loud what your trap is. Your botch being that you maybe are not considering whether or not Rot's caress on the other side of the gauntlet can hear you plan this trap. Or for that matter, even understand English. I mean, most spirits don't. Most don't, yeah. I need to lead it off. I need to give you a chance to gather the people and do the plan. Dan, you're our best shot at beating this thing if it catches you. It won't. Well, one, I don't... I'm fairly sure it can't cross the gauntlet right here. Okay. John... I'm going to stay away from any of the weak points. Hold that thought. John pulls over. I need to check something with Dan. If you guys will excuse me. Sorry. You fucking... Yeah. John gets out, slams the door shut. As you get out, you see Estrada zip tie his own wrists while he's in the back seat with another person left alone. John gives like a, a subtle nod to him, kind of like respecting the choice. And once out of the car, 
John takes off the suit jacket, starts rolling up his sleeves. Give me a full plan. Lay it out. What are we doing? I don't have all the details on the trap part of it. That's with Jesse. But there is a trap plan. Right. Okay. That was part of the scouting that he did before. He came up with an area. He came up with a location. It can be used for the Bishelo, but I'm pretty sure it can be used for Rot's Caress. It's in some abandoned kid's play place near the, the factory. Near the factory? Yeah. I hate your plan. <sighs> it was close to where the majority of the nest was. No, you're you're right. I'm just... I'm processing. Oh. Uh, look, you're the expert. I don't... I don't know what to do. And if I'm going to be totally honest, I'm not a huge fan of us splitting up. But we agreed that there may come times when we have to. If you feel we've got to, okay. I'll do my best to cover my end of things. Well, you got to bring them all together. I don't think... I don't think they'd ever suspect that I'd be the, the chase on this one. It's usually Jesse's job. So this could give you guys time to get ready, prepare. I'm going to be a little bit toast by the time I get there, but five hour run, I've done worse. All right. So we try to hit for dawn. Once the moon's down, Jesse should be good to go. Okay. I'll get them. I'm going to get these two to the house. Contact Aviva. See how Jesse's doing. And we'll get to you as soon as we can. Just, you know, man, let's not let this go to shit. It's never the plan. It's never the plan. Dan, like, empties his pockets. <laughs> Just any kind of, like, weird random bits that he has that might weigh him down. But, like, I'm going to do part of this in Urhan, but I might have to do part of this as a person. So, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be totally honest, like, even if townsfolk saw Dan, like, running around shirtless at yeah. night, like, it's not... No. I mean, I'm still going to be wearing this coat. The it's going to be suck because of the coat. Oh, yeah. But at least it'll subsume if I'm in Erhan, as long as I'm not somewhere. You got the walkie-talkie? I do. Okay. Stay in touch. If you're going to be out of touch, let me know you're going to be out of touch. As soon as you're available again, check in. Okay? I'll do my best. You get out of here. I'll wait till I can feel it again. As the two of you are talking, you start to feel it again. Oh, never mind. It's like, time for me to go. You see Kendra and Estrada in the car, just like suddenly unnerved again. Like you see Estrada even like pull his feet up onto the bench seat in the back, like not willing to have his feet down in a dark place he can't see. I grab you by the shoulders, give you a hug. Like get John hugs him back. Yeah. I just stay safe, man. We'll see you soon. Uh, John's gonna hop in the car. All right, we're out, guys. Yeah, let's, and let's get out of here. John is Dan going to be okay? What's going on with Dan? Dan is definitely stretching. <laughs> Kendra looks at him stretching. Yeah, respect. Yeah. Let's just make the most of it. And John will drive off. As John drives off, that feeling of dread starts to dissipate the further away you get from Dan. Dan, it does not go away. John tries to keep him in the rearview mirror as long as he can. And after a pretty short time, Dan is lost in the darkness behind the car. John, you drive off with Estrada and Kendra in the back of the car. Estrada still zip-tied, leaving Dan behind you. What do you do? John's actually going to make it back to the house. The last thing he kind of really wants to do at this point is endanger more people. So he gets to the house and lets them out, you know, come in, get comfortable. He's going to kind of stop Estrada at the door. You are going to need to, we're going to need to cut the zip ties. Yeah. And here's, here's why. I've got to go. And I know you are willful enough, stubborn enough to keep Kendra safe for now. I just need to make a phone call, maybe run a quick errand, and I'm going to be back. And when I'm back, we're going to get your stuff figured out so that you're back on your feet fully. Yeah. Um, okay. I know, I know this is a bet, but I'm betting on you. 
He holds his wrists out to you. I cut them. Cuts the zip ties. Hand goes to the gun at his hip. Takes it out. And starts to walk into your house. Hey, uh, Kendra, is it, right? You know how to fire one of these? And he hands the gun over to her. I give him a nod. And the two of them walk into your house. Once the door is shut and I'm just alone on those front steps, I will then center myself and place a phone call out to Aviva and hope that something, nothing crazy has happened to the only other cell phone in the group. Aviva, Jesse, Lola, you're out in under the night sky by the remains of Aviva's motorcycle with your newly acquired possessions. The phone in the pocket of the anorak jacket that Jesse is using to cover himself begins to ring. Jesse nearly jumps out of his skin and starts pawing at the jacket to get it off him as he uh, shifts down into Urhan and becomes a wolf and scampers away from the jacket in terror. Phone, phone, phone. Lola releases Aviva's arm so that she can retrieve the phone. But she also looks a little startled from a reverie by the sound. Given what all of you just went through, not maybe a surprising reaction. But it is just a phone ringing in the pocket of the jacket. And Lola, you can pick it up, no problem. All right. She picks up the jacket, reaches in, and hands Aviva the phone. Jesse growls at the phone as it, as it leaves the jacket and passes over to Aviva. John calling. Aviva looks like she's going to say something, but she sees the name, and with a roll of the eyes, one hand, she goes to toss the jacket back near Jesse, not on him, near him, and to answer the call. What? Uh, he looks a little caught off by the, the tone. It's me. Uh, Dan's in trouble. Where are you? Ugh, um, what kind of trouble? We're at... Jesse, what's the name of this place again? Um, Jesse has... Oh, shit, you're so he has gone. He, he has gone back into the jacket, but he's mm. kind of in the process of transforming. And the words kind of come out a little bit garbled. Basically just answers, like, Woodridge Park. Or Union Park. Union Park comes out of his garbled half-man, half-wolf jaw. Yeah, 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 Union Park. Uh, round where there's, like, the... I don't know, the fucking electricity boxes and all that shit. Look, there's a change in plans. I need you guys to get back to the house as fast as possible. Well, we don't have a ride, so that will be walking speed. What about the bike? Yeah, we don't have a bike. Okay, all right. I'm going to get to you as fast as I can. Just uh, sit tight. Find out everything you can about Rot's Caress. I think, I think that's the name that Dan used. Okay. Rot's caress. Got it. I'll be right there. Aviva hangs up. Jesse is definitely perked up at that. Is Jesse still a wolf? What's the deal? At this point, he is back to being in human form with the jacket wrapped around him. He does not look happy. Sorry about the phone, but it sounds... You're trying to poison me? What? The phone! What the fuck does a phone have to do with poison? I don't know. What is... What? How does that work? Dan's in danger, so we can talk about how cell phones work another time. So what you're saying is you don't know. Anyhow, what's going on with, with Rot's Caress? I don't know, I was gonna ask you. What, what is Rot's Caress? It's a problem in the Hisseel. A spirit that's gone crazy, so to speak. That's Sounds the like easiest it way to put it. must be the thing going after Dan right now, no? Or has something to do with it? Wait, why is it going after... Jesse stops a little bit. You can see he's kind of thinking. I've got as much context as you've got, but John's coming to get us so that we can go help your brother. Okay. Um, Wait, John's coming to get us here? Yeah. Okay. Um, And Dan's in trouble with Rot's caress? That's my... I mean, John asked about Rot's caress. Did he say what kind of trouble he was in? No. All right. Um... I'm not going to be able to be any help. Oh, I think we have to use that bedsheet thing, right? In order to be able to fight back. Bedsheet thing? The bedsheet coin thing. Oh, that's 
the ritual to get into the Hasil. Is that how we fight it? Well, that's how I get you guys into the realm of shadow. I don't know if I should be bringing you to fight this thing. And to be perfectly honest, I'm just kind of baffled about how Dan could be getting involved with this thing. Is it possible the thing got involved with Dan rather than Dan chasing it down? Do we have a way of, like... Wait, Dan was at the house when I last saw him. Where where did he go? He went to the meeting with John. And that's where trouble started? We need some more answers. We need to get with with John. By the way, do you still have the things that he kind of, like, motions over to you and looking for the box and the keys and all that? Aviva just pats herself on the chest. She had sewed the keys in her bra. It's still definitely there. And you guys had the box, right? One of you has it. So Lola just kind of looks down and where she is unconsciously, like, still clenching her arm around the box. Mm Mm-hmm. Jesse, is there anything we can do to find out more about Rot's Crest in the meantime, or is this just so we need to talk about what the fuck kind of thing? There is a spirit that my brother and I are pretty close to called Watcher in the Branches. Watcher in the Branches might have more information about Rot's Crest, but we're not going to be able to talk to him, it, unless we go into the Hasil. All right. Is that time we can afford to spend if Dan's in trouble? To be perfectly honest, I, I think I, we need to know more about w- how exactly he's in trouble. I mean, I can't really see him crossing over into the Hasil by himself. And, I mean, I, I guess... <sighs> Is it possible for him to get dragged in? Can spirits do what you do, jumping back and forth? It's really tough. And they have to, they have to do it at a place where the gauntlet would be thin enough for them to get across... I mean, I guess the Beshalu could be damaging the gauntlet enough that... Where was the lodge meeting? I'm assuming by the factory. And there's a pretty big hole there. Maybe he... I don't know. We need We need to... I can't really cross to talk to him here. We're probably better off just learning what John has to say about what's going on. Then let's walk out to meet the car. That Not waste any time. That was my thought, too. I'm glad you both were there. I don't know how you both showed up. Yeah, neither do I. But I'm glad you were both there. This night's been one hell of a trip. Kind of felt like you brought us. I meant to bring you like I... like I made Dan. Yeah, I have a lot of questions about how you seem to have created sentience, but... It wasn't sentience. It was an automaton, I guess. It was just a dream, huh? Yeah. But not my dream. But I still have... I I don't have the words right now. But it's it's just... I'm I'm powerful in dreams. It's really interesting. So how is it possible that the realms are crossing over like that? Because normally you don't drag people into dreams like that, do you? No. I, I open doors to the hedge. Aviva, where did you... Where were we? We were, as far as I could tell, in your head. When I pushed in, ah, by the way, Lola, the Akamoth is back for part two, the second one, and trying to worm its slimy little way into all of your heads, so keep an eye out for that. But where exactly did you go? Your head. But before that, you were, like, slipped out of reality. I couldn't, like, smell you? I went into the twilight. (laughs) Hmm. At my best guess, we were in the dream of a mind mage. And if you were in Jesse's head, you probably weren't as far as you think you were. Like Jesse was kind of dreaming? I'm just baffled about how all of this crosses over. I, I... I was able to see the Akamoth because I can always see into the twilight, like, like any other ghost. Is an Akamoth a ghost? No, but that's a whole other thing. What is it? I don't fucking know. We gotta ask John about that one. It's an abyssal something. Piece of shit. I think his mom is a lot closer to the abyss than maybe he wanted to believe. Yeah, I think so. Lola, I know you want to have sympathy for his mom, but I feel like over and over we've tried to be like, 
hey, try not being a fucking bag of dicks. And she just keeps choosing that road. You can have sympathy for someone and still have to stop them because they're doing the wrong thing. It just means you can understand why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. She's crazy. She's, she's thrown away any ability to have empathy for anyone except maybe John. And she's working strictly on what she believes is logic. She's everything that's opposite of me. She's broken and she's hurt and she couldn't feel it anymore. So she threw it all away and just does what she thinks she has to. But what she thinks she has to do is anathema. What she thinks she has to do is put reality in a bubble and never let change happen for fear of the pain it will cause. And we can't let that happen because if she had stopped time in the wrong way and the wrong time, I would still be in the hedge. For that matter, there's way too much coincidence about how everything is going to hell in this town all at once. And the one thing that chills me to the bone is that fucking tower. The one that I haven't seen? He nods and gives a strong look at Aviva. Aviva kind of quirks her head at Jesse. What? I'm just saying that that tower might be the one pulling the strings here. But who built it? I can't imagine anything building that thing. Seems to be at the center of it all. And it definitely seems to be the end result. Like, maybe it's still in construction. I mean, she said there's nothing we can do now, but that feels like something that He's someone who doesn't want you to do things would say to try and There's get always stop. something you can do. Almost always. Nothing is usually the wrong answer. Lola, as she walks, is once again hedging closer to Aviva and like gradually like worms her arm around Aviva's just so she's anchored to someone. Again, Aviva doesn't stop Lola. She doesn't it's it's almost this like sense where Lola is very extraordinarily empathetic. And I think Lola could pick up that Aviva is purposefully holding herself back from what might be the automatic instinct to push Lola away. She's choosing not to do it, but it's at the surface of what her instinct might be. As the group of you walk down the hill, eventually you hear the sound of tires on gravel and see headlights in the trees as, John, you roll up to one of the entrances nearby to Union State Park. John gets out of the car, and one thing I do want to note, uh, before he leaves, uh, actually, the the officer already has one of the walkie-talkies, He has a talkie, yep. Okay. Can just get anyone, too? Okay. Then he's, obviously, he heads out here. Uh, When he gets out of the car, it's still mostly in the suit. It's just a... He's just kind of down to the vest and roll up sleeves now. And he is going to flash his flashlight out into the dark a couple times. And with his other hand, use the walkie-talkie to reach out to Dan. Dan checking in. Yeah, yeah, I'm still moving. All right. I'll hit you again in five. Sounds good. The three of you can hear that. Uh, and Jesse, with your like senses tuned up, you can smell that's really John. That's the car. And for your own edification, that's really Lola, and that's really Aviva, who are out here with you, too. Jesse uh, hu- uh, hustles over to where John is. What's going on with Dan? Is he all right over there? He is buying time. It's hunting him. Lola and Aviva then are probably just behind Jesse. You guys okay? Lola looks completely spent. Like there is L- nothing Lola. left. And she's got blood trickling from her nose and a split lip. H- how'd you get here? Are you okay? I, I, No is probably the correct answer, but I'm trying hard not to just say that I'm fine. I was in your mom's dreams. We were in your mom's dreams. And then Jesse and, and Aviva came and, and helped me get out. And we have her keys and we have her lockbox. His lips thin at that, and he gives a quick nod. The keys are important. Let's let's make sure Dan's all right, and we'll talk things over, okay? 
it doesn't make what your mom is doing any more right, but I understand why she's doing it. And I think you're the key to stopping her. Not what you can do, just who you are. Like I told you. That gives us hope. We'll need Dan too. Where's Dan? Is Dan okay? He was at the house. How how long have I been gone this time? Get in. I'll explain on the road. You don't have any extra threads in there, do you? He kind of looks down at just the anorak jacket he's wearing. Yeah, he pops the trunk. Jesse goes over and starts rooting through some of the extra clothes in there. Finds an outfit for himself. Yeah. As uh, Jesse's doing that and everybody's sort of getting into the car, Lola, you slide into the back seat, front seat? Where you? She's probably back seat. Okay. Lola gets into the back seat, passes you, and John, your eyes are drawn to a little metal lockbox that she's holding. And I need you to roll me a resolve plus supernatural potency. To be clear, Aviva is joining Lola in the back seat. One success. With one success, a flood of emotion hits you more than maybe since you first awoke. And with that flood of emotion you get a brief picture of yourself at like, I don't know, three, four years old, getting tucked into bed by a man whose face you can suddenly remember saying, good night, son. See you in the morning. Love you. And the door closes, and you are suddenly aware that is the last time you ever saw that man. John grips the temple of his skull like he's suddenly been hit with a migraine. John, not you two. Are you okay? The lockbox. Uh. He's in there. I remember him. Aviva, who's been very purposefully quiet and standoffish, does look over, connecting the dots on that conversation and the way that John's looking at it. Is it bad or. John just kind of wipes some tears from his eyes. I, I don't know what you mean. We gotta go though, Dan. Yeah, sure. You don't have to pretend to be okay. I'm just saying what's got to come first, I guess. And he like, he just kind of tries to not look look. in the eyes. Yeah, like. (laughs) Like, okay, I get what a pain in the ass I've been to you guys. He's very purposefully like worrying about Dan and just kind of like wiping. Aviva just looks over at Lola like that. You know when someone leans backwards into the car seat and like lays their face sideways to side eye someone? Mm-hmm. Exactly that side eye at this moment. Before she turns back and kind of returns to this quiet standoffish mode. Hey oh. Dan, check in. How you doing, buddy? Going pretty good. I'm going to sign off for a bit. I'm switching forms. All right. Uh Lola's back from dreams. So Good. Good. She's okay. I'll talk to you guys in a bit. All right. Be be safe. So wait, he's just running away from Rot's caress in the real world? Yeah. Jesse kind of looks up to the left like he's doing some mental math. This is really not good. I mean, this is Dan. Can't he just kick the shit out of it? This spirit, even before it went crazy, was really powerful. I... To be perfectly honest, I don't know how he and I together would handle this thing. And John's going to start the car and go while they talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesse goes to grab the the door on the, the handle on the back of the the back seat, and then realizes it's full and kind of like awkwardly goes to the front seat and like sits in the front seat like he doesn't really belong there. <laughs> and the car pulls out and onto the streets of Asheville. John just kind of gives Jesse a shrug and then Jesse goes. Starts, <laughs> Jesse starts playing with buttons and dials for like the air conditioning I don't know how I can help Dan if you can leave me somewhere I can I can get some fuel but I have nothing left he's going to be on the run for a few hours I'm getting back to the house oh fuck so there's people there long story short the situation in the cult is very complicated it's the pins through them whatever this tower is is weaseling its way into the minds of the people associated with the cult Kendra uh, very nice woman uh, I guess and uh, local cop uh, they're with us uh, at the house right now laying low 
The one um, whose car we stole? Yeah. He's over it. But the reason for it is Kendra was being stalked, harassed, what have you, by these Beshili rat creatures. John hands his phone off towards Jesse. Check with your family. Let's just make sure that Kendra's not the only one that's been harassed. Jesse takes the phone from him like he's holding a dirty diaper, and he kind of just looks at it, turns it around in his hand, goes, all right, how do I do this thing? All right, give me the phone. John, <laughs> just over. Take his scrolls. Once he has the right number, places the call and hands the phone back to Jesse. Hello? It is clearly Aunt June's voice. Aunt June? It's Jesse. <sighs> oh, Jesse. Hi. Uh, and you hear a gunshot in the background. Uh, hey, hon. Are you busy? You guys busy? Aunt June, what's going on over there? Nah, it's fine now. It's it's fine now. Uh, right? And you hear your grandmother in the background give like a little defiantly assenting squeak. I'm just like, mm. We had some, uh, couple issues, but you... Rats? Thank you for letting us know. Uh, haven't had to deal with this bullshit since your uncle left, but we're fine, Jesse. We're fine. And you can tell in her voice that, like, this was very clearly, like, not a full fucking swarm. But because you had given her a heads up before, right. she actually is probably fine right now. But something came after her. On June, was it rats? Rats and, uh... Do you know Eric Walker? This guy in town, yes. he works with it. Yeah, well, I just blew his brains out. So, uh... Anyways, on, on, uh, on June... Uh, I tried to call the cops. Nobody's answering send, at the station. Uh, don't stop at the head. Center mass. Se oh. Ma, you hear that? And you hear the roar of a shotgun like seconds after she says, Ma, you hear that? Your grandma clearly... <laughs> the sound of thunder. Already <laughs> fucking into it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Good to know. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sweetie. I'm going to see if I can make sure that you have... They have other problems besides the homestead. You guys stay safe. And if things get too much, you call this number back. Okay, well... Uh, Will do. Okay, I'm going to call you back now, all right? And you hear clearly, like, shells being put into a shotgun again. Good luck. Someone, people are buying silver bullets. I don't know if she needs to know that. It's nothing that's going to affect her and my grandma. That's just, for, that's meant for me and, and Dan. You see him kind of look a little bit nervous at, at that information. John takes up the cell phone. Jesse starts wiping his hands off on the pants. So Dan's running. It's his plan. He knows what he's doing, and I trust him. And he plans to stay on his feet and keep moving for a while. So far from what we've seen of this thing, it can't just reach across and get him, otherwise it already would have. Or it's playing with him. Sure, but if, I trust Dan on this. If I was hunting an Aratha that was alone, and I had trouble crossing through the gauntlet, but I was smart enough to work with an army of Bechelou, I would set up traps and spot and pitfalls in, in the gauntlet where I could hurt him to, towards. Rob, yes. when I was doing scouting, mm -hmm. I imagine that I found the biggest hole. The biggest hole is at that place in the fa n near the edges of the factory. Yes. Um, were there other small little, like, like gnawed traps around there, basically? Like, little spots that you might be able to, like, force through? Not near there that you really saw. Like, basically most of the ones that were over there were just chewing the one big Was one. there a spot in town that did have a lot of little, like, kind of pitfall areas that if you were trying to, like, trap an Aratha, you might chase in this area because there would be multiple spots where you could maybe break through on The them. next biggest hole was probably around the church. Okay. And then otherwise, it's tough to tell because of... So unfortunately, because of, like, the weird time bullshit that's been going on around town, it's not a bad thought to have, but things have been so missing recently that you would not, you're not sure where specifically those little holes might be. Right. So right now, I head back to the house. Dan's going to be waiting for us first thing in the morning. And he's going to be at the Fizz Kids, for whatever reason. Uh, Is that place right. still open? No, um, but it's really close to where the where the main Bechelou nest was. He says it's important it's, there. It's a good spot to trap them. Do we have to hide in front of the people at your house? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
they're already pretty spooked, so a little normalcy would be good for them. They're going to know that I'm not Dolores, because there's no reason Dolores would be there. They're not going to be asking a lot of questions, hopefully. Just call her evil twin or something. You said it was... But they're wound up pretty bad, so... And who else? A woman named Kendra. Who's Kendra? So... Kendra is the significant other of someone that is the significant other of Dan. But while Dan cares about them, they wait, who? they never really had a chance at a relationship. So wait, wait, wait. Who, this who? person is with Kendra. Jesse, you would know your brother well enough to know that the like the one that got away, the one that was important, was uh, a woman named Jen. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's yeah. that's why I'm that's why I'm wondering. Like I'm just waiting yeah. I'm waiting basically I'm Jen, waiting for him to... Jen and Kendra are together. Wait, Jen? Yes. So this is Jen's, like... Well, Jen's out of town, so Kendra ended up being the target. Of the Beshalu. Right. They're going... They went after Jen, presumably, because they somehow know that Dan cares about her. How the fuck would they know some shit like that? Dan seems single all the time. They've been been watching? Five minutes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I've seen your phone. <laughs> <laughs> Just busting it. I mean, Sorry. so I could figure it out. Here's so maybe. Here's the could. thing, Beshalu are pretty clever, but I think this is a step beyond them. When Beshalu damage the gauntlet like they do, it causes a drought in the Hasil, and spirits there get very hungry, and they start cannibalizing each other in ways that are not intended. When a spirit becomes a cannibal and starts eating other spirits, they blend their meaning. Ugly combinations start sprouting up. That Magath thing you were talking about. Its name used to be Carrion Feast. It was not a pleasant spirit to be around, but it was natural. Um, The end of things, being consumed by lesser spirits... It's just part of the regrowth cycle. It has probably always been one of the strongest spirits as far as I can remember. And if it's been eating all of the lesser spirits, it could be doing weird things. Some spirits of that, that sit in trees and watch or in dark places and watch could become very dangerous if it wants to look across to the Hasil and gather information. The priest also just looked like a person. I mean, how long do these Beshalu live using people? I don't know the exact timing of it, but they hollow out the bodies of their victims, and they usually just state they're young inside. Lola actively dry heaves. Well, we got enough time to try to prepare and get ready. Do you have enough time to check in with your gross Grubbler friend and see if he has any info on this? I haven't heard anything from Grubbler since the church. Mm. Jesse gets real quiet. Jesse, you know that the Watcher and Branches said that Carrion Feast devoured specifically a spirit of fear. And you know that the Grubbler knew a lot about your family because of how close everyone was. If Carrion Feast, I mean, if Rot's Caress ate a spirit that knew a lot about me and my brother, it would probably remember those memories. Did you see it? He, he looks at John. I didn't see it, but... Did you feel it? I felt it. Something, I felt something, under, something underneath about to touch you? Reach out and grab you? I saw the way his bottom lifted his knees and the backseat of the car. Afraid that something might reach out from under the dark to get him. So, a lot of this is lining up. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, fuck, I... And Aviva just kind of, like, sinks back further, shaking her head, uh, an apology. Lola's jaw clenches. You can see... Aviva can probably see on her face. This is another thing that I have cost that family. Jesse kind of just sniffles a little bit. Shouldn't be getting close to spirits like that anyways. We'll be all right. If we're going to go after this thing, I need to see it. 
before we do that. It's hunting my brother, but we need to view it. And then we can catch it, and we can trap it. And maybe if it's got a connection to the Beshalu, we can trap them as well. And this is going to be one hell of a throwdown. But that's the best bet we got. If you all are willing, I can bring you with me into the Hasil. But that means that you need to be ready for that. And Lola, you need to... What can we get for you? I'm not going to feed off of you guys. To find feed. Steal what you're feeling and your will to feel it. Is it important what the feeling is? No. Then take mine. I don't need it anyways. Won't. But there is horrible sorrow coming off of Jesse, like in waves, if you can see that sort of... I think you can, right? I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah. There's a couple of people at the house who are not going to be able to get any rest after what they've seen and felt tonight. Maybe... Jesse, I'll... I'll take yours if you want me to take yours. He nods. But I... I don't want you to not feel this. He cracks a smile at you. A sideways smile. And just says, don't don't worry about it. This is what we've got and this is what we'll use. Let me see what I can get from them first. And then if I... God, I fucking hate this. It makes me feel like your mom. People have a right to feel how they feel. If they're using it to hurt people, then we take it away. But people have a right to feel what they feel. My mother uses the way people feel to control them. All you're doing here is taking the edge off. You are nothing like her. More than that, just let me feel useful. Jesse, you pulled me out of the hedge. You were there when I came out of the thorns. I wouldn't be here if you weren't here. Dolores would have found me and hidden me away somewhere. I owe you. I appreciate that. But I'm going to need you and my brother's going to need you coming up. And if this is the way to get you back in shape, it's fine. It steals your will to feel it. Lola, I know you're looking to protect us, but I need you just to listen to us and trust that we're a team and a pack. John kind of looks at the rear view mirror. (laughs) We are as weak as our weakest link, so I need you to be in fighting shape. And I need the same for you. Take them. Lola, while the car is still driving, probably not the safest choice she's ever made, sort of like lets go of Aviva and crawls over into the front seat and just kind of sits on the console so that she can take Jesse's hands. Aviva very quickly lets Lola untangle and ducks like she's getting out of the way so that Lola can perform the unsafe acrobatics of sitting on the console. As as she's kind of crawling forward, Jesse actually just puts an arm back and kind of lets it dangle into the back seat. Nothing touches your hand in the darkness. Until Lola does. And she just kind of sits with him, kind of letting her empathy guide her to, like, mesh their wavelengths, so to speak. As you kind of, like, slowly take his hand, you definitely feel a swelling of emotion at the touch. And once she's able to ride that wave of emotion again, she will attempt to harvest. Make the roll. Between the penalties and bonuses for the, uh, for the emotions that Jesse is feeling, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to take a total duel plus one die bonus, kind of evens out to a one die. Okay. This is not fear that he's feeling, O Maiden of the Autumn Court, Mm -hmm. but it is potent nonetheless. Two. And you gain two glamour. Jesse, it's not that you suddenly feel less sad, it's more that you feel... The difference between sorrow and not being able to truly feel the depths of sorrow... That numbness can feel a little like gray area between the two. And so it's not that you don't feel sad anymore. It's that you are suddenly numb to the sorrow that you had been feeling. It is put away and you don't... It's not that you're not going to process it at some point. It's that you do not currently have the energy or the will to process it. And instead, there are other things to feel, other things to do. She kind of gives his hand a squeeze when she's taken what she can are you okay yeah 
Yeah. If you need more, hit us up. I'm sure that we can figure it out so we can get through with this. I do. John had mentioned that there were two people at the house who specifically right now were feeling a great deal of anxiety and fear. Which is very tasty indeed. Um, For a member of the Autumn Court? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's wait and see what what I can... Yeah, I get it. You can get some off the people there, but the people around you, you can accept the gifts they give and all that shit. I'm trying to figure that out. Mm. There's always a loophole. There's always... There's always a cost to a gift. And maybe that's something I need to relearn. Guess it's paying your friends some form of respect to trust their judgment and all of that. I did. That's why I that's why I wanted you with me in Ramona's Bastion. Where are you locationally? Are you still sort of in the middle of the back seat? Yeah, she's still kind of riding on the uh on the center console. Aviva, having kind of gotten out of the way so that you could have better access to commune with Jesse's feelings, has kind of set her arm up against the glass of the window so that she can lay her head against it and just really kind of flatten comfortably so that you have that room. There's, with that, the side effect that there's really only half of her face available to see the expression of. She seems to like it that way. She just kind of nods. I'm gonna need to find some plasm when we get back to, so. Lola kind of like eases surprisingly limberly, you know, balancing on one foot like a stork at some point as she kind of eases back into the back seat without landing like in a puff. She just lands with some kind of grace and she kind of curls up in a ball and looks at Aviva. I don't want you to think that I don't trust you or want to. But okay. so much of me is missing, and I'm trying to get it back, and I appreciate your patience, and I'm sorry if you feel like it means that I, I want this. I'm so fucking lost. What? I don't know. I thought you were saying that you wanted me to be able to trust you, and I wanted you to know that I do, and I'm doing my best to do that. A roll of the eyes that doesn't seem as reflexive. She doesn't seem to really want to... She's a little aggravated. By the topic. She doesn't seem to want to delve deep. But she just kind of resets once you're back in your spot. I mean, are you? Or are you still sort of in the middle of the back seat? Like, did you go to your corner or are you like still... No, <laughs> she's she's looking for contact. She, just, <laughs> she knows Aviva's aggravated. She doesn't particularly care that she's aggravated because she's aggravated a lot. Mm, yeah, it's, it's really hard to tell the line. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she just curls up by Aviva. The walkie clicks on in the front seat. Hey, just checking in. We're on our way back to the house right now. Okay. You guys okay? Yeah, no, everything's everything's fine. Uh, I'm still me, so. There's just TV drinks. Yeah, I know, I already found it. Good. You got like no fucking food in this house. Um, I'll try to fix that. It's, don't worry about it. And the group of you drives back towards John's house. Dan. The feeling of dread continues to grow stronger around you. Where do you run? What is your plan? You have a lot of hours to play cat and mouse here. I think I'm going to start with my normal, like my normal everyday jog, just to like give myself an ability to think while doing something very routine. Because I'm fairly sure that it can't hurt me. It could just make my life very uncomfortable. <laughs> But I do know that I will have to cross the gauntlet at some point, and I need to figure out how to do that. Where you're going to go for it? Right. Right. And it seems like it can't keep up with cars. It seems that way. So I would need to, like, briefly ditch it and then maybe get into a vehicle and then go through a different, farther away... Locus? Locus. The quarry is farther away. The From where you are, the... I mean, you just came from the one at the factory. Right. Maybe you don't want to use that one. Right. I mean, but I got to do it. But if Jesse's right, there is maybe a hole nearby. Yeah, and a whole bunch of fish. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that too. It's a possibility. Mm-hmm. I just need to get it so that it is at least far enough away that I can make the transition through and it's not just waiting for me. Mm-hmm. 
and that's the hope. So I think he's going to do that run for his just normal run in, in his normal being human for now. Mm-hmm. And then I think I'm going to come up with the fact that I should be able to, I think I might be able to convince it that I'm going to jump through at the quarry mm-hmm. like I always do, mm-hmm. but try at the last minute to not dive in. So like it'll try to get ahead of me. Okay. And then I'll double back at that point towards something nearby. The closest one to the quarry probably from there is the whole slash locust that was at the church in the collapsed church basement. Right. I mean, Um, in theory, the locust is still there. It's just in a destroyed basement at this point. Tell you what, how about you roll me a survival plus manipulation? (laughs) <laughs> sounds sounds like I'm gonna spend a willpower on this. <laughs> Dan, not a manipulative guy. <laughs> Two successes. Two successes. You are doing your jog. You manage to double back. You don't have a car that, that you can like. Right. So joke around in. One, I'm gonna have to do it closer to dawn because it's gonna. It has to be the last stretch. I can't be. Yes. So you have to like just go around for a while. Yeah, I'm gonna run around like a large parts of the forest and the as the wolf, just not and and then head back out and run around town a little bit and just. Mm -hmm. It should be the dead of night, and the only cop in town is not is is currently occupied. So. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You're not wrong. There might be some crazy cultists out there, but I'm not terribly afraid of normal people right now. Makes sense. Two successes. You actually manage to do the thing that you're trying to do for a while. You will get ahead of it. You'll lose that feeling for a while. And then it'll start to creep back up so you don't lose it completely. Because you're trying to pull it off. Right, right. right. I mean, So you can't completely ditch the thing. Right. Yeah, currently I'm not I'm not planning on doing that. Yeah. This is like the last last moment. And I think I think the last part of this plan is that towards the end of the day, in the beginning of the morning... I'm going to start looking like I'm flagging a little bit, probably because I am. And anybody that leaves to work early-ish. Yeah, absolutely. I'm thinking maybe Gary. Gary uh, is very <laughs> punctual. Um, <laughs> I'm going to steal his car. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, we'll get to that. Um, and, and you could probably just ask. More or less, that's the plan. <laughs> So, what I'm hearing is you're going to basically run around all night. Yep, for the next three hours or so. For the next so. three hours or so. Then you're going to kind of head over to the Wallace residence. Yep. To see if you can borrow slash take Gary's car. Yep. So that you can definitely get ahead of it and ditch it for a little bit to try and convince it that you're going to the quarry. And yep. then you're going to go elsewhere. Well, I'm going to go to the quarry with the car. Leave the car there. And then convince it that I'm jumping into the quarry. Mm-hmm. Get back in the car. And then drive off as fast and crazy as possible to get to another locus. And this part, when you're running as fast as possible, this is like right before dawn. Right. So that... Right. Right. And then hopefully they will be somewhat set up in the other side of the seal by that point. So let's dial it back in to at one of the points where you are running around for the evening. Sure. Roll me a stamina plus athletics for the night to see how winded Dan is going to be after leading this thing on a chase. I'm just first Gary's <laughs> Gary's marriage site is flooded out. <laughs> that his car gets totaled. He's having such a bad month. I'll fix his car if that happens. There you go. <laughs> Discounted, not free. Even with willpower, not a single success. <sighs> okay. Nine dice. <laughs> so Tim. Yeah. Dan at the end of the night, when it is time to go, is going to be fatigued. Got it. What that means is you'll start taking dice penalties from being that exhausted, and every six hours you're going to have to reflexively roll not to just pass out on your feet because you are so tired. Here's the deal. Dan is an incredibly athletic guy. Yep. Switching back and forth between your forms and doing all that. Like, truly, there probably is no one else in town who could lead Rot's Caress on a chase like this. Rot's Caress never tires. Nope. And he is much faster than you expected him to be. He's probably got extra legs or something. So every time Dan, basically every time Dan goes to like take a rest, he only gets a minute or two before 
that creeping dread feeling starts to pull up on him which again. Which is also not restful. Which is not restful. Right. And about halfway through the night, as you're leading it around, you know, John is called to check in. You know, was surprised and you were like, hey, I'm going radio silent. You hear a voice out of the darkness. I wanted to come for you first. And this is unnerving because, you know, obviously it's unnerving. It's coming out of the darkness. But two... Rotskares is on the other side of the gauntlet. Even if you stop and check, you can still see him there. Right. But that aura of fear and dread has been coming through. And maybe it's because you're getting tired or maybe something else is happening, but it feels like it's been getting stronger. And you remember that sort of entropic, like the, the magic on the car that John put there started to decay pretty quickly. And now it's speaking to you across the gauntlet. And it is not simply in the first tongue. It is in a horrific blend of first tongue and English. Kind of like the Grubbler used to say. Who was like a weird... He just spent a lot of time with you guys and he could speak. And so you hear a voice in the darkness say, I wanted to come for you first. From the other side of the gauntlet to your ears. Without you extending your senses. Well, that's decidedly bad. Do you say that? (laughs) Probably. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. There are only two Uratha in this area. And both of you are not enough. I can run unchecked. You think to lead me into a trap. But who is harrying what prey now? Ratha. I'm just going for a jog. You, you can keep up with me. <laughs> I'm still going to kick your ass. There grubbler is a, or super grubbler. There is a wet chuckle from the other side of the gauntlet. And now, Dan, what is your resolve plus primal urge? Five. Then I will be removing five dice from this pool. The creeping dread of something coming to touch you out of the shadows for just a few moments becomes so overwhelming that you are paralyzed. You cannot bring yourself to move. The dread of being touched from out of the darkness, it changes a bit. It becomes more crystallized. And what you suddenly fear is your body failing. The inevitability of the rot and decay of flesh as your body turns against you. You can feel in your mind your muscles weakening, your organs failing, your skin sloughing from your body as everything rots. You see now what you face, Uratha. There is no escape. From the caress of rot. And then the feeling starts to fade and you may move again. Unsure of how long it's been that you've been frozen in abject terror. But you are Rahu. You are strong. You can shake this. And you continue to run. Feeling those steps behind you. Knowing that it stalks you across the gauntlet. And it is getting probably about a little bit like an hour before dawn. And that's about when you wanted to head over to Gary's? Yeah, about whenever he's going to start going out to his car or whatnot. And maybe he's one of those ones that still warms it up. Not so much in the summertime, but you definitely know he does in the winter. Yeah. And you head over to the Wallace residence, and you know Gary pretty well. At this point, you manage to outpace Rot's caress for a little bit again. Maybe letting the pace... Slack in a bit. Slack a bit. Yeah. Uh, I mean, up to you, but... Yeah, just and then get a burst of speed and then kind of ditch him by taking a couple crazy turns. Yeah, I mean, you're a pretty smart guy when it comes to these kind of, like, tactical hunts and stuff. Having Rot's caresses sort of aura of absolute terror happen when you're trying to have a conversation with Gary Wallace. Gary is not the strongest. He's not Rahu. He's yeah. not. Uh, so outpacing a little bit then. And you show up, and Gary's house is dark. His car is still in the driveway. And you know his schedule. He usually is very punctual. And there's a single light on inside. Gary hasn't left yet. And the light seems to be coming from, like, the living room. Just one, like, lamp. 
you get a feeling that Gary might not be going to work today. I'm big enough to knock on his window and be seen from, like, the windowsill? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He's got, so, like, a little ranch, so, like... Yeah, I, I go up to his window that in the living room and, like, knock pretty rapidly, but quietly, but, like, noticeably. Gary is sitting in, like, a lazy boy, like a, like, like a recliner, and he's just sitting there. He looks confused and frightened. Something that you'll notice is that on the ground in front of him, like in a little pile on the floor, is a bunch of compost. Orange peels and eggshells and little bits of fluff. It's just sitting, staring, with like his phone in his hand, but he doesn't know who to call. Mm-hmm. And lying on the ground in the middle of that compost is a dead rat with two tails. And he doesn't seem to, like, you knock on the window, he doesn't seem to, like, even register. Like, he, the man is probably in shock. <laughs> I guess I go to the door. It's unlocked. Gary's one of those guys who's like, just leaves his door unlocked because, you know, bad things don't happen to Gary Wallace's. And the award for worst night goes to... <laughs> yeah. I first look right around the hallway... Because I'm almost sure that Gary's one of those people that puts keys into the bowl, like near the oh, door. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I'm gonna grab uh, those. Not not a bowl. It's just hanging out. Like he's got a hook oh, okay. system. You know what I mean? Yep, Wait, yep. is it is it one of those hooks that's like labeled too? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> and it's on the bottom of like a little wood plank that just says like "Home Sweet Home." Yeah, that feels laugh, right. Laugh, pray, love. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it would be an arrow if it so were. So I'm laugh, uh, love. I'm gonna first pick up the keys. I'm gonna go in there and. Uh, Put a big hand on Gary's shoulder. He practically jumps out of the chair. Like, he did not even recognize that you walked into the house. Oh, hey, 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 Dan. Hey, Gary. Uh, what's, uh, what's, hey, Dan, what are you doing here so early? Well, it's uh, a strange night, and a lot of things are happening, and I feel like you know some of that. What do you mean? I look pointedly down at the compost pile. Yeah, I just, uh. Came home. Dolores loves to garden. You know, I don't know what her compost is doing here in the house. Gary, we'll need to talk, but for right now, I don't have a lot of time. And unfortunately, all I can do is offer you this hug. I give him a hug. He hugs Dan back. I need to borrow your car. It's pretty serious. Sure, anything for you, Dan. And do you know where John lives? Where John lives? Yeah, John lives. Yeah, doesn't he live... does he spend a lot of time with his uncle? His actual house. Oh, no. Why don't you go to Ernie's and tell him you're looking for John? Dan, it's like 4 o'clock in the morning. I, I don't know if... Ernie's probably awake. Okay, sure. Um, You know, take your time. Yeah, I could use a walk, probably. We'll get back to you maybe a little bit later today, tomorrow, but we should probably talk about some things. Hey, uh... You see Dolores, uh, you let her know I'm looking for her, okay? Yep, that's probably the things we should probably talk about, but, um... Okay, because we got, um, got some stuff to talk about, I'm sure, you know. She was really upset about the church. Gary very clearly still in shock. Is there a Beshalu on the floor watching this conversation? There's a dead rat in the middle of a pile of compost. Okay. Um, this may or may not be an important question, and Dan may or may not be able to know this information. Is it apparent how the rat died? <laughs> that would require a little bit of investigation into the death of the rat. Yeah, fair enough. I do not have the time for that. Fair, fair <laughs> enough. But clearly it didn't get shot. <laughs> yeah, it's not like there's no smell of gun smoke I have, or anything. I have a theory, but... <laughs> I think it starved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you take some few minutes there, you know, get some coffee and go maybe bring some food over to Ernie. I think I think you could use it. You know what? You're right. And always be neighborly. Yeah, yeah. So I give him like a, a double pat on the shoulder. Sorry, man. I gotta go. No problem. Don't worry about filling her up. I, get... I just trails off and he's still just looking at this dead rat and pile of compost. I leave and uh, I close the door behind me and... As you close the door, you see him like starting to walk into the kitchen, probably to put the kettle on to make some coffee. And I get into that fucking car and wait for the dread presence it is at this point not long before it shows up all right well i'm convincingly tired so this is a this is going well yes 
You can feel your body betraying you even now. I wish my ears would betray me. <laughs> <laughs> Get the car floor it. <laughs> and you outpace the presence for a little bit. I need to keep him. I need to outpace him enough so this car doesn't fail when I need it to. Roll me a drive check. No bonuses or penalties to the car. Just as flat. One success. Car's holding up. Gary's car's not in great shape. Gary's the kind of guy who puts a lot more money into his front yard and his house and his, and his fiance, wedding vineyard and his wedding stuff. <laughs> yeah. Truly, uh, and his like fiance than he does into his car. But you manage to outpace and you get out to the quarry. John, Jesse, Lola, Aviva, uh, you guys are in the car. You were headed back to John's house. Mm -hmm. You arrive outside. The lights are on inside. John, all your curtains are drawn. John Gunn looks at it and nods to himself. And all of you are here. Lola, even from here, you can feel the fear inside. Lola kind of takes a minute and like licks her sleeve so that she can wipe some of the blood off of her face so she doesn't look immediately alarming as she walks in. The group you head inside? How far away from the graveyard here? Uh, not far. I gotta find more plasm. I can be right back. Why would you... Why go to the graveyard? If that's quicker, yeah, sure. Which one, which, which one are you suggesting you do? I don't think... We've got a couple hours, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. So quicker's not really the concern. Okay. Let me grab a jacket. I'll go with you. Aviva pulls a face, but she doesn't really have a good argument against it. Make sure you guys are back sooner than later. I know we, it's a few hours till dawn, but I want to be in the Hasil far before that. It's okay. going to take us some time for you guys to cross, and moving through there is not going to be easy with you not being a Ratha. All right, there's some gear inside for you guys. Um, Armor. Uh, actually, why don't, I, why, don't we, why don't we get inside very quickly? Yeah. Tell you guys what I need to give you. And then we can do any splitting up that for preparation that needs to happen. There are walkie-talkies inside. Kendra has one. So when we go off to the graveyard, if that's what you want to do, we're still reachable. Okay. Okay? Let's get everyone geared up. It's quicker. John opens the door uh, and kind of just holds it open for the group. Come on in. Inside, the, the TV is going. Uh, you can see Estrada by, like, your kitchen table over by the windows that go out to the back. He's got a bottle on him. He is drinking your whiskey right now. He's just got, like, a glass in front of him. Does not have his gun. Uh, the gun is on Kendra, who is sitting on the couch watching over the top. Lola, instantly you can clock that, like, both these people are trying different avenues to feel okay as best as possible mm -hmm. Strato looks up from the table Kendra looks over real fast sees that it's you guys and just kind of relaxes and goes back to watching a movie Estrada sort of tips his glass to everybody coming in and goes hey everybody welcome to the party seems like you got started before us yeah I thought it was probably best you can also see that Estrada's ankle is handcuffed to the bottom of the table. How big is the table? It's pretty heavy. Okay. It's like heavy, nice wood. Yeah, I assume this is the one that Aviva sat us all at when she performed her ritual. Mm -hmm. It's it's pretty sizable. Aviva's eyes dropping to the cuff beneath and all of that transfers her annoyance over to that and says, hell of a fucking party. Yeah, well, uh, here we are. Um, anybody else want to drink? Or well, what are we doing here? Where's uh, where's where's Dan? He's still out and Dan's still putting in some work. We'll be catching up with him soon enough. Okay. Hopefully by tomorrow afternoon, things are better. Well, that would be fucking great. And he just goes back to drinking. I'm gonna order some pizza. Sure. I've got to get some things prepped. He kind of like tiptoes past through over to where all of his bags from the time they slept over were mm -hmm. and digs through and finds a little box, kind of like jingles a little bit when he picks it up. The mirrored coins and the strips. 
I got a few things I gotta I guess I gotta find. He looks out the back window. There's some woods out there, right? There are, yeah. They go back to the old uh, rail line. Perfect. Hey, um, I'm gonna be in back getting stuff prepped. Give me about an hour or so, and then I, you guys want to probably head that way. All right. Take a walkie. <laughs> a walkie talkie. I'd rather not, if that's okay. Either that or I have to go with you. It's just not good juju for the ritual. You don't have to leave it close just so you you can hear me if I call for you. He gives you a sour face and takes it. Thank Once you. again, like he's holding something that is altogether unsavory. So you guys in a little bit? Yeah. He heads out towards the back. John, where do you want this? And she gestures to the small lockbox. He looks at it and kind of like starts to tear up again. I think it's safest with you right now, right? Okay. Then the keys. Where are they? Aviva just shoves her hand inside her shirt and pulls them out. May I? He holds a hand out. Yeah, she just slaps them into your palm. John kind of like moves the keys between his fingers, kind of making the clinking sound that they make. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like her magic. Oh, absolutely. Huh. The sympathetic link. Uh, John puts the keys in his pocket. Why don't we go ahead to the graveyard? Lola, you're all good? I'll, I'll be okay. I'm going to order some pizza. Before I go, I think we had spotted the person that's looking for you in town. Her face blanches a bit. You're not alone here. And I, from what I had seen, I didn't get the impression that they were any close. But she kind of moves her eyes to gesture toward Estrada. Did he cuff himself to the table, or did you? He did. He says from the other room. Did he have a reason for cuffing himself to the table? It's got something to do with the cult. She All does. he's trying to do is make sure that no mistakes happen. But if we're in danger, I should let him go, or I should leave him there. Okay, fuck the graveyard. I'm not leaving if he has to be handcuffed to a table. We're going fucking to the table. graveyard. He says kind of like sternly and looks back. <laughs> Estrada's here to help, so treat him like he's here and a friend. Anything unusual happens, it's not because he has any desire to. There's just some thing about the cult. We're okay. going to help him out. Like, just as John is talking, sort of like interrupts with a whiskey glass tip towards yeah. everybody. Okay. Okay. We'll be right back. Okay. John's gonna order some pizza. Like it's two o'clock in the there. morning. In a small, uh, there's no nothing. There's nothing. <laughs> I hate it when diners aren't twenty four hours. Let us know if you need more. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but just I had the mental image of just like, man, I fucking hate it when diners aren't open twenty four hours. And then cutting to the people who own the diners who are currently like in a fucking shotgun <laughs> fight with like rat monsters. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, I... Was... That's no guarantee to me that they're closed. <laughs> I shot that guy dead a while ago. <laughs> anyway. I don't think there's anything I can make. I'm sorry. It's okay. Just means we gotta have a big breakfast. Okay. Lola kind of proceeds over to the table where Estrada's sitting and sits on top of it and kind of looks at him. John opens the front door and holds it open for Aviva. Aviva does go through, although she's seems to be avoiding eye contact. Lola, as Aviva and John leave the house, you are left there with just a small woman sitting on a couch watching Sylvester Stallone arm wrestle people and a cop handcuffed to the table drinking whiskey. He sort of like pushes the bottle at you. You need some of this still? No, that makes my brain break a little bit. I'm Lola. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Which part? I'm Lola. My name is Lola. Uh-huh. You're not Dolores. Never have been. She's my cousin. He takes another drink of whiskey. This is not unexpected. Why are you handcuffed to the table? Colt does something to people. Gets in their brains. John says I got stuck when I was out. Like in a, in a box or a corner? As in, they stuck me. And now whatever it is that's in them is in me. Stuck you with what? One of these. And he pushes the pin out onto the table. Why do you still have it? If it can do bad things, if it sticks people. 
And what's the alternative? Leaving it on the street for some kid to pick up? Coincidence has been fucked in this town recently. I'd rather it be with me. I mean, you could also just throw it in a garbage compactor or something. It's been a little busy tonight. I get that. So, Lola, it's your part to plan all this. If you're not Dolores, who presumably is somebody else. Your cousin, you said? Yeah. So the person who's been around for the last while, at least as long as I've been in town, is getting married to Gary Wallace in a week or so. That's That ain't you? No. Okay. Any other day, I would not be... <laughs> I would be more skeptical. But today, it's been a hell of a fucking night. I get that. Is there anything I can do to help? I don't think so. I mean, if we had gotten pizza, what kind would you have wanted? I was going up to this place that did uh, ham and pineapple, like a Hawaiian, but they also put maraschino cherries on it. That's, uh, ain't no place around here that does that, but... No, but you could probably ask over at the diner and they probably would do something like that for you. I hate ordering off menu. It's fucking rude. And he just drinks. She, she kind of gives like a cockeyed smile. Erica. Yo. As Lola is sitting here with the simmering fear of these two in the room. Mm-hmm. Are you trying to harvest glamour? Mm-hmm. Trying to find the right moment for it. But she sits and chats with the cop about pizza and how she's not the woman that he's seen around, even though that they have the same face. It's the two of them chat, and he seems off-put by a lot of what you're saying. Mm-hmm. But because you take your time, because you sort of simmer in their emotions, draw them out through conversation between the bonuses and penalties to what they're feeling right now, you're actually going to take a two-die bonus to this roll. This will be for both of them. Because there's the two in the room, What whatever your successes are, add two okay. successes. Okay. Yep. Six successes plus two more would be eight. Then you regain eight glamour. As you see Estrada sitting right next to you sag a little bit, open up the whiskey bottle, pour himself a generous four fingers of whiskey after the glass he just had. And at this point, he's not even really listening to you when you talk about stuff. He just has another drink. She takes, before he can get the four fingers to his mouth, she kind of reaches out and takes the glass from him. Now what the fuck? I don't want you to be drunk if you have to keep her safe. God damn it. Yeah, okay. And she kind of, like, moves the whiskey and stuff away. And then she kind of, like, lively gets off the table and heads to the kitchen. And she comes back a couple minutes later with a bad cup of instant coffee for him. Yeah, that'll do. She has one for herself. She'll make one for Kendra, too. Kendra takes it and then, like, kind of looks around the kitchen a little bit. And you see her dump some protein powder into her coffee. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> They're both monsters. <laughs> <laughs> but I know how to make it good. <laughs> and for just a second, you're like, oh, God. This is just like a little tiny Dan. <laughs> <laughs> and she drinks it down. She doesn't mm-hmm. seem to mind at all. And they well, drink the coffee. There's no judgment. Well, it's like, yeah, it's been a hard night. So she's going to go searching around the kitchen because she remembers that it's only been condiments and such. It hasn't gotten any better. You guys used the chili and shit. I know. Less good than What are the chances he has maraschino cherries? None. Absolutely none. In a jar Zero. Zero chance of Dan having raw sugar in a bowl. What about John? Yeah. Fuck, you're right. (laughs) Not maraschino cherries, but the the There's a there's a yeah, there's a thing of grenadine. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's grenadine, olives. (laughs) All right, so she gets out the grenadine and an energy drink. And she splits the energy drink into three glasses and adds, she has no idea what the fuck she's doing, and adds like maraschino, jerry, juice, grenadine. Estrada it's just, basically hummingbird feeder at this point, which is pretty on brand for Estr- her. Estrada just watches you do this. So I can't have whiskey, but I can have fucking that. This won't get you drunk. Oh, God. <laughs> You don't have to have it. It's just, just an offering. Give it to me. And she slides it to him. And we will cut away from that. <laughs> this is clear where she is a space alien. <laughs> J 
John and Aviva. Mm-hmm. You step out of John's house, out into the dark night. Pretty immediately as they get out of the house. How tall is John? He's like just a little taller than six feet. So Aviva is over average height. I, I forget what I said. I think she's maybe five seven about. But she is trying already to outpace John. Not going to be horrifically successful with someone taller than her who also makes a habit of walking around all the time. But she's trying. John will move to keep pace and kind of brushes up against her shoulder with his. So what's going on? She crosses her arms over herself and keeps trying to look away. And she says, it's nothing. John, that's a lie. And with that lie, he gets context, correct? Yeah. He sure does. Aviva, how about you fill him in on the context of it's nothing? What does that translate to in this case? Do I give him like a rundown of emotional state or just the contradiction to it's fine? or uh, It's vague flashes of insight. Think of it more like, clues as mm-hmm. to what's bothering her yeah. rather than well this is what's really bothering her like you know what i mean yep. yeah yeah he brushes against her shoulder and when she says what she says maybe a collection of moments since they saw each other again of her trying to avoid eye contact like she thinks that that will help her to be less vulnerable could come to the forefront as a hint. Another hint could be something about the lack of certainty in her answers previously. She's usually pretty... I mean, she'll listen to other people to some extent, but she flip-flopped pretty hard about whether or not to go to the graveyard and seemed to just be experiencing some lack of trust in herself, maybe, in that moment. A phantom pain, like Aviva believes herself to be of harm to John. I know I mentioned it to you before, but I can see the truth in things. And he kind of, like, turns to address her directly. Prompted to be confrontational, provoked, of course, she turns to face John, and she just goes, So... So why do you think you're bad for me? I didn't say that. I know. She looks like she wants to keep speeding off and, like, takes a half step, but then, like, looks back because she's realizing, like, I super didn't say that seems to be the thought coming across her mind. How much does the truth thing work? Are you asking, like, how accurate it is? Or how much does it show me about what's bothering you? I thought it was just like a sensor thing. In a way it is. The fuck does that mean? What does it do? It means that you're upset. Something happened. And now, it's like you're pushing me away. And if that's what you want to do, okay. I'll respect any choice you want to make. But I don't feel like that's what you want to do. We've got a town to save. Dan first. When we save Dan, that can be the first step to me not... She pauses, quite possibly getting tripped up on the new information. John holds his hand out. Your call. You just said that you think I think I'm bad for you. Yeah, but I also know you're wrong. No, you don't. You gonna tell me how my stuff works? It's like the temptation to say yes is just telegraphed. You don't need, like, magic mind reading powers to, to, like, get that across. It's just, it's written in cartoon letters in the air. John, your mage side sees a big cartoon (laughs) fuck you up here. (laughs) Is that what's happening? Subtle. Very subtle. (laughs) She pulls it back. She hears how stupid it sounds in her head manages not to say it (laughs) but what if it really was bad for me to come back here and what if (sighs) i'm right if you were to make a call like that just because of some what if you'd be 
making it the truth. It'd be self-fulfilling. There's always the chance that you get burned or something goes wrong. I'm not worried about me getting burned. I'm worried about me changing you. I definitely change when you're around. But it's not a bad change. I don't know. You don't know? Okay. I don't know if you think that just because... I, we, we need to get the plasm. I... <sighs> I don't know how I'm supposed to say to you that, like, I don't get if you understand, like, I could be, I'm, I'm dead, right? And that's not meant to have happened that way. Me being dead, and I shouldn't be putting that on the rest of you. I get it, you all, I can be of some use here. And that has a cap. And then I'm just a problem. So you should get used to that. I would I... love to get used to you being my problem. Think of it this way. We have choices to make, too. About whether or not we're comfortable being around you. Don't just take that choice from us. From me. I'm well aware that things can go wrong. I think we've all seen plenty of trouble these past few days. But I think I have a right to decide what is and isn't worth the risk. And while I appreciate you stiff-arming me and pushing me away because you care, I prefer if you let me choose. Sound fair? Aviva fully looks away from John, trying to hide tears, battling between two options. She seems like she wants... To pull the trigger on one. But she's bad at it. She ends up just snatching John's hand. Like if she keeps going to the graveyard, it's not acknowledging it. John gives a slow nod, puts an arm around Aviva, and walks with her to the graveyard. Not really saying anything, just kind of taking the opportunity to be happy. The graveyard in Asheville in the middle of the night like this is a cold place, unnaturally so. Every graveyard in existence has an Avernian gate, a door directly to the underworld. The chill of that gate permeates the area. The death energies of a graveyard are abound. There are some ghosts that the two of you are able to see, even if no one else typically can. The Avernian Gate here is, there is like a huge stone marble slab right in the center of the graveyard. It is the oldest mausoleum. And instead of like coming up out of the ground, it is just laying across the ground and there are steps that go down to an ancient door. As if you are truly descending into the earth itself. The two of you do not need to go to the Avernian Gate, but there is no way that a geist and a Moros mage could be here without being aware of it. Aviva looks at it for a long time, like she's considering it. But when she pulls her hand away from John, it's to actually investigate where she thinks Plasm might be. John's gonna let her do it. He kind of, he definitely doesn't wander too far off. But he starts, like, looking at each of the graves one at a time, kind of either investigating something or imagining something, but he definitely lets her consume her plasm in private and just keeps close. From just the little manifestations of ghosts, particularly when a geist who is an anchor begins to walk through. John, from sort of a, even though you're giving her her privacy, from like of like an observer's perspective, you see the ghost's more manifest just because of Eva is around. Dead souls, or at least the echoes of them, that step from graves or between the tombstones, one after another. Aviva, you can gain five plasm just from sort of the, the manifested little bits that you can pull off of, you know, tree branches or old dead flower pots as the ghosts manifest around you. I begin to walk through the graveyard. None really in need of, like, 
serious help in this place, but more just the natural existence of the dead. Aviva kind of checks with them, but if they seem all right, she'll just say to task. She'll just meet back with John to see what he's doing. John's kind of thoughtfully crouched by a headstone. Aviva crouches, too, to look at it. Do you think my dad's buried here? Do you think she would have given him a grave? I think it's um, hard to forget someone if their name's written down like that. I don't know how it works, right? Maybe if there's a grave here and if no one can see the name or it looks like someone else, I don't know. But if she... When we looked at her memories, it seemed like she really did love him once, so maybe... She just threw it away? She got hurt and... When we saw the memory that was hidden away, she could look and see everything bad about him. When he lied, or when he cheated, or how he could... And Aviva takes a pause in that same way that she'd been taking a pause before, and says, hurt her. So I don't know. Your mom seems pretty fucking vindictive to me, but... If he's got a body, it's somewhere, and you don't really need a body to give your respects. I was thinking I might find him, if there's anything left. Stand straight. It's weird, because I always knew that she took things from me, but I never really imagined she would go that far. I'm sorry you have to learn. Yeah, I guess so. All right. I think Jesse's going to be ready soon. Yeah, we, we should, should get, back. get yeah, that that I Are you good? Do you have what you need? Um, I got back most of it. I guess I could look for more, but Your call. If you want to help and it doesn't hurt what you're doing, then Aviva like looks guilty for a second about asking John to do magic. Okay. Let's get back to the house. And, uh, I'll prepare something. Okay. Yeah, let's go. Jesse, you head out the back of John's house into the woods. So Jesse wants to set up a ritual to actually prepare two effects. The first is... He wants to pr- call down a, a siskarda, a sacred hunt, for them to go after Rot's caress. And in doing so, he is going to prepare the group of them to actually be able to pass through the gauntlet at the quarry. Okay. He has a few different items that he sets up. He does so by actually going to like a, a path a little bit out in the woods where there's some dirt. Actually, he transforms into Dalu and uses his clawed hands to dig a furrow in the dirt and create a a large circle. And then he finds a couple of stones, hopefully a rather large flat one, and creates kind of a table, but not really for placing things on top of. He just creates a dark ledge under the table where he actually places all of the items for the ritual. In this case, there are going to be four participants. So he places four pieces of cloth that are a dirty, rusty brown, having been soaked in the blood of a werewolf. He places eight polished coins under that table ledge as well. Then after setting that up, he prepares a little fire off to the side kind of creates a little mound of dirt next to there where he puts some twigs and branches basically is making himself a little bit of uh, charcoal while that's burning down he goes up into the trees and takes a handful of of other mirrored coins that didn't go under the uh, under the edge and places them up above looking down on the ritual site 
reflecting little bits of light from the fire. And when you go down, it almost look like several sets of eyes keeping watch over everything. Finally, he goes back into his little box and pulls out a small set of nasty little rotten branches that almost kind of look like antlers. And he begins fixing together a mask. The mask consists of these two kind of broken branches in the semblance of antlers. And he actually also pulls out a a few old, beaten, worn-down work gloves. And it fixes the work gloves together in kind of a mash of different wiggly parts with the antlers over top of them. And once he gets all those things prepared, he will sit nearby and wait for everybody to, to show up. After a little while, Oviva and John come back to the house, find Lola. The three of you can see the light flicker of flame and the reflection of watching eyes in the forest. And all of you know that this is probably about the time that Jesse is waiting for you. I'm going to bring some things outside with me for the ritual. Okay. Uh, But I need to make a casting roll for one part of it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, do it up. I load it into a bottle of rum, but the contents of that bottle are turned into seven points of plasm. I gather up that, uh, which is an exceptional success. I actually gain a point of mana out of the deal. (laughs) uh, Nice. Big deal. Big deal. (laughs) Um, And I'm also going to bring out the armor that was in store for the different members of the group. Okay. uh, Which largely looks like jackets, but is provides lots of armor for a viva he brings out what looks like a fighting gauntlet and once everything's kind of ready he'll start like carry this bundle of stuff out towards where the waiting ritual is Aviva, during that process had gone over to lola to ask you good you topped off she <laughs> her lips are very red <laughs> <laughs> What the fuck is this shit? I trying to look like. All right, tell me this the, feeding shit has nothing to do with the vampirism. Nothing. Right now. Nothing. Okay. It has everything to do with grenadine. Estrada nearby looks like he's gonna be sick. <laughs> like, <laughs> not because he's drunk. He's just like, oh god. Oh. He also has red lips. You are I've seen what too much whiskey and grenadine does to someone. <laughs> it's bad. It's bad. I'm as good as I can be. Aviva just looks from Lola to Estrada. Kendra, too. To Kendra, this woman that she does not know and has not said hi to. Kendra looks fine. Yeah, but... No red lips? (laughs) You can tell. Okay. Yeah, she's doing good. Just huffs out a long breath of disgust. At whatever you've done. Uh, honestly, Aviva <laughs> doesn't even know what you combine the grenadine with, but it's enough. Grenadine, straight from the grenadine. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> I, I honestly assume that's what she... I assume that's what Aviva thinks happened, oh, is that grenadine shots. Yeah. <laughs> Goddamn ancient. I'm not a monster. I've mixed it with energy drinks. Let's just fucking go before I wish you were a vampire. Let's go. Lola hands takes a cooking pot from wherever John keeps them and gives it to Estrada in case he does get sick and follows. He does not say anything, just gives you a thumbs up. Mm-hmm. She gives Maybe because he doesn't want to talk in case he throws up. <laughs> she gives him <laughs> finger guns. Estrada's had a bad night. He had his ass beat like an hour ago. <laughs> well, now he's getting his insides beat. Ew. I wasn't going there, Rebecca. <laughs> Where were you going then? <laughs> Erica, Erica, be honest. This is your, uh, yeah. We don't when believe you. When is it here, guys? Lex, when is gone? You know that that's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now fucking kiss. <laughs> Aviva, once she's checked with Lola, will start to walk out and spotting that John has a bunch of things. There's that old temptation to, like, steal something from the bottom of the pile. Something still gets in the way, and she keeps walking towards the light in the woods. The three of you walk out into the darkness. 
Jesse, you hear them coming. Everything prepared. Jesse is uh, sat on the ground in front of the little mound of fire, which is actually burning down at this point. It's almost just down to embers. You can see that there is a mass of gloves tacked together with a pair of rotten-looking branch antlers sticking out of them. And he's got his back facing to you. And in between you and he is the circle he's drawn into the ground with the mound of rocks within that circle. In the flickering of the firelight, the finger mask almost looks like it's moving. Jesse kind of reaches up, to uh, motioning to the boughs above from the trees. Take a seat and be watched by the watcher in the branches. John will uh, quietly set down the things he brought out by the people that are meant to receive them, and he finds his seat. Aviva sits too. She's curious about both the items in front of her and the branches are getting some suspicious looks at the concept of you know, something unseen staring back. But you know, after resolving herself by looking directly at the branches back for a bit, she, she settles. Lola has a seat, just kind of curls into a ball on the ground, just kind of unconsciously starts rubbing the part of her arm where Jesse drew the glyph marking her as a member of his pack. Jesse reaches forward once he hears that you've all kind of sat in the circle and lifts the mass of dirty old gloves and kind of lays it on top of his face and affixes his impromptu mask with a tie around his head. And when he stands up, you notice that he is a little bit taller than he normally is, a little bit more muscular, hairier, and large claws growing from his gnarled hands. And he begins taking steps around the circle and speaking half in English, half in first tongue, in a cadence that almost sounds like he's, whatever he says in first tongue, he then repeats in English. Hikaun Ur, the black wolf, has banned us to let nothing desecrate the sacred places in our territory. There are forces at work trying to do that very thing here in Asheville. Tonight, we will strike at the representation of that desecration in the Hasil. And when that desecration is destroyed, that momentum will carry us on to defeat the other desecrations reflected in the other realms This will be the beginning of a cleansing of our territory. When he has walked back around to the mound where the charcoal resides, he quickly bends down and smashes it open, letting the charcoal spill out. And then he walks back around another pace around the ring. If you reach your hands under the stone table, you will find the items you need to begin this sacred hunt and cross to the Hasil. He pauses, waiting for you all to comply. Lola is very quick to do as he says. John reaches under the table. Yep, Aviva's ready. When you reach under, you find a strip of cl- uh, strip of cloth with the feeling of dried cake blood and two mirrored coins. Any facing on the coins has been polished off at this point, and they just simply catch light from the uh, embers of the fire. Jesse bends down and picks up each strip of cloth and slowly puts it over your eyes and ties it shut blindfolding you in order to cross to the Hasil and find this beast we hunt you must be blind to this world only see into the shadow you hear him pace back around towards where the charcoal is and you can hear it kind of crunching between his his fingers and you can hear him making some kind of markings with it Then one by one, he circles around, and you feel his rough, clawed hands wipe some kind of gritty, what you can only assume be charcoal, onto your cheeks. You are now marked with the color of Hikaun Ur, Black Wolf. You will not be seen as you become hunters in the darkness and cross into the Hasil, and we shall hunt this being, this Rot's Caress and destroy it. 
Jesse then takes the two mirrored coins and places them over your eyes on the other side of the headband. The gauntlet is a mirror, and when you look into the mirror, you will not see the reflection of this world. You will see the reflection of the world beneath. Carry this with you and remember this as we cross. And then he actually folds the headband up so the two coins are kept in the fold of the headband and you guys now are able to see. When he does this, you can see that he has discarded the mask and it lies amongst the shattered mound of embers and charcoal that he used to cover himself in black soot. And you can see that everybody else has, has the same black soot painted on them as well. You are now prepared, Uratha Hursi. Little wolves. He looks over at the jackets that John brought. You will gather up your tools, your weapons, and your armor, and you will follow me to the Hisil. He kind of solemnly goes over and grabs the jacket intended for him, puts it on, and then starts heading out towards where the quarry is. The group of you, thus prepared ritualistically, begin to head off into the night to engage in the sacred hunt. Dan, it is getting to be a little before dawn. You head with Gary's car out to the quarry because you still intend to sort of ditch him there, correct? Right. So you arrive at the quarry, park the car, walk me through what you do. I'm going to move fast. So I'm going to like, I kind of wanted to leave him behind, but it's going to be kind of clear that I'm going that direction because there's not much else out here. Absolutely. So and the then quarry get... is where Carrion Feast was first born. Right. I will get there. I will like get out of the car. It's still running. It's parked. The doors open and everything else like that. And just start booking it, like making it straight up the attempt that I'm going to try to outpace it to the locust at the quarry. The general thought is that most things are smarter than me. So I'm going to assume that he thinks he's smarter than me too. And when I go to make that dive, it's actually going to be at an angle. And I'm just going to end up like going back to the other cliffside so that it's going to try to get ahead of me. And then I'm going to get back in the car and get the fuck out and go head towards probably the church since that's the first, the closest. That is the closest crossing point. Right. The feeling of dread at this point. It has been hours that you have been running, leading Rot's caress on a chase from one side of the gauntlet across the other. At this point, that feeling of dread is overwhelming. Whatever is happening with Rot's caress is continuing to grow. Its voice still occasionally taunting you. And you hear as you run towards the cliff, Thank you faster than me, Ilaratha. And you make your leap. Roll me an athletics check. You use strength. Yeah. <laughs> For your edification, this last leap is what is going to push you over the edge into fatigue. Got it. That'll be two successes. Two successes. You make your leap. You run... Because you're looking on this side of the gauntlet rather than the other side, right. I'm pretty sure that it fell for your trap. Yeah, I can. I, I was thinking about just letting my hearing so that I could hear it move through in a way. And the dread presence moving away is really yeah the biggest the, the, the indicator. The terror starts to move away from you. Right. Now you are so tired. You are extremely fit. You are Rahu. You are Aratha. But running for this long, wolves are not stamina predators they are ambush predators you have pushed yourself to your limit but you still got more reserves in the tank you can do this so you head back to the car yep full yeah. tilt mm -hmm. get back in and just drive it away and you get back in and the car will not turn over it won't I, start i didn't leave it i didn't turn i it understand off. it's off you had a dramatic failure earlier and as you try and start the car you hear a little squeaking something chewed up the wires inside the engine and then the dread presence begins to overtake you again. And you hear a voice from the shadows go, Think you more clever than I. Corey's a big a big area, right? Yes, it is. I get out. I kick the door. Take a breather. Very tempted to light it on fire. <laughs> Poor Gary's car. <laughs> There's a big dent in the door where you kicked it. Take a deep breath and go, Eh. And just go for the quarry. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, 
exhausted from running for hours. But with the car sabotaged that you took from Gary, you make your way quickly to the quarry and the locust. Being that I've already tried to outsmart him and somehow he snuck a rat into the plans. Done playing, done being smart. I'm going to perform our usual ritual, jump off this cliff and go fight this Magath and the Hasil. You plunge into the cold waters in the early morning brisk refreshing for a moment for the first two turns of this combat do not take the fatigue penalty as you lit quite literally splash cold water all over your body <laughs> cool down swim uh. down and then swim up in the his seal like you and jesse did before like you've done so many times together here during that time i shift into my dalu form which is near man Gaining my extra size and strength and muscles, growing longer claws and fur starting to come out of my body, hair elongating and whatnot. Still wearing the jacket that was specifically made for this form. The jacket, which had been hanging loose and heavy on you as you'd run all night, suddenly is filled out. You can feel it around your skin as you come out of the water on the other side, disturbing the little motes of water spirits as you do. And the first thing that you recognize is the smell of sweet rot in the air. Those little hints of things that you were getting from the other side, the, the aura of like fear and the smell of rot are nearly overpowering as soon as you breach the surface. And standing on the shore in the exact spot where the carcass of a deer in the real world once gave birth to it, is Rot's caress. Now you can see it fully. You can see the, like, maggot fingers dropping off of it, the swarms of little, like, flies with their wings as hands, the, the arms that make up the, de the rotten deer corpse's ribs uh, staring right at you. Before, it was whispering to you in English, which is strange for a spirit, but you remember that the, the hand grubbler spoke English too, sometimes. And in first tongue, it says, Welcome to my home, Uratha. And then in English says, Dan. I will say that because you dove straight in and didn't hesitate, you can pull two essence off. Uh, that had not yet been devoured by the rot spirit. Excellent. I will automatically use those. <laughs> okay. So I will be pumping my strength and pumping my ability to fight. Okay. Uh, giving myself eight agains on all brawl checks. And then I perform like a leg out kind of small bow. And it's like, I give honor to carrion feast. There is no carrion feast any longer and then in English again Dan and then in first tongue it is gone and we are something more now and from it on the ground you recognize those like finger maggots and hand insects like when you kick over a log and there's just a shit ton of beetles and stuff and worms underneath it's mm -hmm. like that spreading out in like a nimbus around it on the ground you recognize it's all part of the same organism. It's just has this warping, rotting effect. And while you're over here, actually, no, what is your current resolve? Three. And what is your primal arch? Two. Plus one defense bonus on this for honoring the spirit despite it being a Magath. This will give you a six total defense on this. Don't like that. By honoring the spirit like this, you get hit with that aura as soon as it's speaking to you of fear, of fear of your body failing you, fear of your flesh rotting, of being touched and having your skin and your, bo and your meat slough off the bone. But you honor the spirit, and maybe that was enough to deny it its successes. And strangely, it bows to you too. Its arms going, it, the arms that would be its antlers going wide in sort of a, well then, let us begin gesture. 
radiating confidence and fear and disgust. And now I think we need to roll a niche. Sounds good. 14. It will be going on a 14. So I'm going to let you go first. So you're in the water right yep. now. It is on the shore. Half speed for swimming in the water. If you rush, you could probably get there. But tell me, Rahu, how you are going to fight. I'm going to charge it, and at the last moment, I'm going to like juke and then hit it from the side just to not go directly into its antlers. Sure, yeah. Make your attack. And subtract 10 from your attack roll. <laughs> As always, my first attack roll is terrible. Um, so one success. Mm-hmm. One success is still honestly not too bad. You go to swipe at it, but it's it's like swiping at a cloud of flies. You know what I mean? That doesn't mean, however, because Dan is who he is, that he doesn't take a number of the flies out of the air. His hand coming away, sickly sticky. Now that you are this close and you have damaged it, now that you are this close to its aura, automatically you are gravely sickened. So what that means is that you are going to take a minus one penalty to all your actions... It's going to increase by minus one cumulatively every two turns that you stay within the aura or until you get it dealt with, and you will take one bashing every round. You swipe your hand into this creature of rot and fear and madness, and it begins to literally rot you away. And now it acts. And what it will attempt to do is grapple you with its many arms rearing up onto its hind legs and its arms that make up its ribs opening up as in to grab you and pull you into it. What's your defense? Four. And it has three successes to grapple. Uh, So the two of you are grappled and you're not going anywhere. As soon as the hands grapple you, I need a, yes, a resolve plus composure check. I'm going to spend a little power on this. Okay. One success. One success means you do not suffer the insensate tilt, which basically means the you can feel the hands grabbing you and pulling you into its chest cavity. You can feel the little like maggot fingers and things just touching you everywhere. And the feeling of it is so revolting. And the fear of being touched is so overpowering for a moment that you're afraid you'll just lose all sense of of anything and just freak the fuck out. But you're Dan fucking Swanson. So you don't do that. And while you are being grappled by this horrific monster, you retain your mind and do not utterly lose it with horror and revulsion. And that's round one. Round two, you're up. Fuck this guy. We're going Garu form. Spending an essence. Okay. He's not damaging me, so the coat's not as helping as much as I would like right now. <laughs> well, uh, he hasn't yet, but yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. No, I got you. So I believe since it's my turn, it is now a contested grapple check in both for both of us? Yes, it is. So yeah, as I'm grappled by a finger elk, I essentially I just, I'm just mad at this thing in general, and I just start getting larger... And the hair starts coming the 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 face elongates and the the giant tawny Garu, the two legged monster essentially, uh, erupts in its grasp as I seek to break free from it, and then we'll see how that looks. With its big ass dummy dice pool, it only got four successes. Two successes. Two successes. The Garu form swells and, like, some of the, like, maggots and rotten flesh are just thrown off of this thing and as you swell within its arms. It goes back to the ground so that its arms ribs continue to clutch you inside of its mass. Right. You take the bashing, uh, which will heal at the end of the round, but you take the bashing for just the rot. Yep. And now it will just roll a raw attack against you as the arms the like tiny fingers and arms inside of its rib cage. I just, specifically, it's, it has some sort of specific grapple attack. Or it's, yes, it yeah. does. And it's just going to try and pull yep. you apart. 
and you will take four lethal damage. And from everywhere all around you, like a voice coming from just everywhere, it just continues to talk to you, too. You, Uratha, would have let us starve, but we are more than that now. The Beshelu, idiot Shartha, useful to weaken the gauntlet, and then I will escape, and rot and fear will destroy the unnaturalness in this place, and I will relish starting with you. Dan Swanson Uratha. And it's so fucking weird because every time it says Dan or Dan Swanson, it's in English and everything else is in first tongue. It's a good thing that I'm already really mad. (laughs) This is the beginning of round three. Yep. Your sickness penalty is now two dice. And the wounds, the little... You can feel it as the fingers and bones and, like, hands are just digging and clawing and ripping into your skin. If you were not Aratha, they would be dissolving you as, as you speak. Right. Uh, th- like, it's not just physical violence. Everywhere they touch starts to rot and fall away. And at the end of the round, you're in Garu form and all of the rot, you know, the very essence of your life regenerates you and pushes the rot back. But this is a losing battle, and if you were just a regular person, you would be dead by now. And you can feel the madness and the hate inside of this thing. And it starts to move away from the quarry into the woods, holding you as it goes, content to just pick you apart at its leisure. Got it. Honestly, not even just Uratha. If you were anyone but Dan Swanson, Arahu... In Garu form... (laughs) You have been running this quarry for hours. It's tough to think anybody else would have made it this far. In the real world, Jesse, you have led everyone to the quarry. Everybody has their things after the ritual was done, taught to you by the Watcher and Branches. At the quarry, the first thing that all of you notice is a car which some of you may recognize, some of you may not, as Gary Wallace's car. The hood is popped, as if somebody was checking the engine. The door is open. Jesse, you can smell Dan in the air. Jesse runs over to the car, does a quick kind of look inside and around, trying to spot where Dan is. You don't see him anywhere, at least on this side of the world. What you do see is a couple of dead, deformed rats. When you look into the hood of the car, you see a couple dead, deformed rats clearly having, like, chewed some stuff in there. He pushes his senses into the his seal, does not dip his eyes there, but dips his ability to smell. The overwhelming scent of sweet rot is everywhere within the he seal. And faintly underneath that is the smell of Dan's sweat. Your brother is in the Hisiel. You know that. Your nose is enough to tell you that for a fact. Jesse swallows hard, looks back at everybody else, and points up to the small little ledge that is often the jumping point that Dan and Jesse use to enter into the Hisiel through this locus. The reflective surface of the water is the portal to the Hisiel. We call it a locus. Do as I do. And you will be carried through into the world of Shadow. He uh, practically runs up to that ledge, looks back at the group of them, and taking the uh, the headband that he placed on himself, although he doesn't have to do this to push through the locus, he wants to demonstrate the last part of the ritual to everyone else. He pulls down the blood-soaked headband over his eyes, so that the two polished coins hidden within cover the eyes and blindfolded leaps off the edge and dives down into the water of the quarry. Aviva will follow soon after. She runs up, making a final adjustment to the gauntlet to make sure that it fits her fists perfectly. And she follows as Jesse has shown, casting one last glance to the other two to make sure they follow too before diving on in. Lola 
takes a minute to actually look through Gary's car, looking for like a strap or a piece of clothing or something that could be used to bind. John actually puts his hand on her shoulder. He's okay. We got to get to Dan. I need something to make Dan okay. I have to hold it in place with something. If I know the name of the person it belonged to, I I can do it. What about your blindfold? I don't know if it'll work if it's mine. Okay. I don't know if that's going to disrupt the ritual, but I go. Pretty comfortable with diving. John kind of naturally just right in. Slur. Lola. Yeah. Are you waiting around to find the things you need, or are you running after everyone else? If after a cursory glance it's not there, she's going to go out. I mean, there's like seatbelts and stuff, but Gary keeps a pretty clean car. Okay, that's unfortunate, but she'll just go. She's not going to hunt her down for it. She's just doing a cursory glance. Okay. Jesse, you enter the Heseal. The three of you who have never done this before, who are not meant to do this, strangely, all of you have the experience of stepping from one realm into another. Aviva through the Avernian Gates from the Underworld. Aviva in particular, the idea of transport by water. It's not quite familiar per se, this is an entirely different thing, and the vividness, the strangeness of this world, that primordial sense is incomparable. However, this has strange parallels to following the rivers of the underworld. Lola, you have stepped from Arcadia in and out of the hedge. You are quite familiar with stepping in and out of realms. John, once upon a time, you have also done this. However, stepping into the shadow is different. There is a sense of primal awareness of ancient existences it doesn't feel old like the underworld feels old or like arcadia feels old it feels old as in what things were like when the world was new a realm of thoughts and ideas that at first is nearly overwhelming for john in particular there is just a moment. He's a very good swimmer, but as everybody else swims down and he doesn't break the surface of the water exactly when he maybe thinks he should, there are some parallel reflections to the last time he made a journey. But as all of you break the surface, Jesse, you first. The scent of sickly sweet rot is almost overpowering to the senses. And the aura of a natural fear in the air. This sense that something from somewhere, from beneath you in the water, from out from a shadow, from behind a tree, is just going to reach out and touch you and your body will fail and your skin will rot. Forgetting Asheville is an actual play Chronicles of Darkness podcast set in the fictional New England town of Asheville. Aviva Caradonna was played by Rebecca Stagelfest. Dan Swanson was played by Tim Davis. Jesse Swanson was played by Garrett Gabby. John Taggart was played by Lex Lopez. Lola Gardner was played by Erica Webb. Your storyteller was Rob Muirhead. Recording and editing by Rebecca Stagelfest. The music used in this episode was by Victoria Borodnova. You can find their music on pixabay.com. Forgetting Asheville uses the second edition Chronicles of Darkness rule sets, including Changeling the Lost, Geist the Sin Eater, Mage the Awakening, Werewolf the Forsaken, and other Chronicles source materials, with a few select house rules. The Chronicles of Darkness are produced by Onyx Path Publishing. Make sure to subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at at Path of Night Pod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash Path of Night Podcast, or email us at pathofnightpodcast at gmail.com. You can help support the show at coffee.com slash pathofnight. See you next time, outsiders. Eric Draven. Wait, no, that's a fucking guy. Eric, that is... That's yeah. the fucking... That's the the guy fucking crow is the after crow, us. It's the crow. No, fuck. <laughs> I knew... God damn it. I knew that's that That's one of the best reveals <laughs> ever. <laughs> that's, that's, I knew I, that's, Aviva, I knew that, there's another geist. I, also, I knew that fucking name sounded familiar. God damn it. Hold on. Let me I was read. like, I thought it was like Craven the Hunter for a minute there. No, I was like, Craven no, the Hunter? No, no, hold on. It's not a fuck. I can't use that guy. Well, I knew I knew that fucking name. Oh, goddamn name. NPCs. It is. Oh, Jesus. And he's driving a Young's mobile. Oh, fuck. Okay.
Yeah, we've not been good matter. I'm, 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 I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. Kidding. Cars are pretty much one of the ones we've like. Yeah. Fuck it. Eric Haven. <laughs> Derek Haven. <laughs> Derek Raven. <laughs> okay, Derek cool. Shaden? Stop it. I, I think Derek this Raven. This is what is happens when I Derek Raven. I can't, yeah. I can't name him Derek Raven. He no has, one has done not? that. It's a totally new thing that's all yours. <laughs> I would do that. So you better be gone. If, if this dude was actually a geist, I would 100% be doing that right now. But, <sighs> all right. Revenge brought me back. <laughs> God damn it. You, you said we weren't planning for any new problems, but here we are. 